Hello and welcome everyone to Brad Brand Licensing and Merchandising Summit Asia organized by LicenseIndia.com. Today's discussion will revolve around how Brand Licensing and Merchandising Summit will capture the new rules of brand licensing and how globally it will bring new opportunities for your brands, retailers and manufacturers. I am Isha Thakkar, Project Head from License India. This webinar will be presented by Bradford, a magazine partner, retailer and licensing magazine, a media partner, total licensing and licensing corner, association partner, the Textile Association of India. Let me start by laying out few ground rules for the attendees. This webinar will go around for four and a half hours. Every session will be followed by a Q&A session. If you have any questions during the course of the discussion, you can post them to the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. Mention in your question if it is directed to any specific panelist. We will take up the questions post the session. Please participate in poll during the webinar. We would also like to request the attendees to keep the question within the scope of discussion here today and not pitch their businesses. Let me now welcome Mr. Gaurav Maria, MD Brand, Bradford India and Chairman Franchise India Group of Inno for the inaugural session. He will talk about opportunities during and post COVID in brand licensing and emergence of India as top destination. This session will be for around 30 minutes. Please post your questions in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Isha. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, friends at the licensing industry, on behalf of uh, License India and Bradford, I welcome you all for this e-edition of Brand Licensing and Merchandising Summit. You know, we have been doing a lot of uh, physical events all these years. The first licensing show we did, I remember, was in 2004, way back, uh, when we saw this industry as an opportunity to uh, come to India. <clears throat> and since then, we were doing this show when earlier it was part of the integrated show of a franchising show where we all had a licensing pavilion. And for last three years, we took the show out and made a separate licensing show. And also we used to be doing a lot of other conferences because we feel that the, the knowledge gap in Indian licensing is, is very big and we need to continue to fill that gap and continue to bring best practices, continue to guide the entire ecosystem on how best practices of licensing works. So this time, because we all locked in and we are having a lot of anxiety, uh, what would happen to the industry, uh, what kind of challenges we all would face, <clears throat> what is happening in the world, uh, because licensing is a connected world. You know, it, it is about taking IPs from one market to another market. And, and, and similarly, merchandising is also a very connected formula, which means that uh, it works on a, a connected supply chain and so on and so forth. So when all this is stopped and everything is held, uh, you know, we have absolutely uh, disturbed connectivity, uh, travel, uh, you know, uh, any kind of supply chain being disturbed and so on. So what is happening to the licensing? So that's why we thought at License India, this would be the perfect time uh, that we all can organize this summit. And thank you very much for all the panelists. Uh, we have great panelists in the, in the, in the uh, four and a half hours that Isha said. Uh, which would share their ideas, what would happening to their businesses, what is their plan B, plan C, plan D, uh, what is they are doing in, in, in changing the way they used to do business, how they see that this business would, would change over the time. <clears throat> I call it, uh, we, we, when this all lockdown happened, uh, probably all over the world, it was taken by surprise. So nobody expected uh, that we will just get into a lockdown. And, uh, and especially for a lot of businesses which were thriving all over. So they just came to a halt. So we went into what I call the anxiety and a hold on period. And this hold on period, most of the times we watch and watch and we don't do uh, much in that stage. Uh, we just keep looking at uh, numbers of, uh, you know, cases, viral cases are growing or things like that happening. And suddenly after 60, 70, 80 days, and in, in some parts of the world, but now about hundred days, uh, people have started realizing that you have to live with this, live with this, live with this, uh, this, this situation and the commerce and the businesses would have to survive given the circumstances we are all in. So similarly for licensing industry also, we all have to think through that is this moment when we are what I call safely opening up, uh, you know, the, the businesses or getting back to a little bit of uh, our commerce. Uh, how do we really see uh, this all shaping up? So I divide this uh, piece into three different 
stages, you know, and the first stage which would hit us for the next quarter is sustainability. And I feel that a lot of uh, 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 licensors, licensees, uh, the agencies, the entire ecosystem, the suppliers, they would all have to see uh, what is the immediate sustainability for them and how that sustainability would come, uh, how they would manage their cash flows. Uh, I see a lot of disturbance, especially for, for bigger firms in this case, because smaller firms are uh, quite nimble, they would be able to find, but the bigger firms would have a lot of challenges. <clears throat> So what is this sustainability idea? How do we, and this is what our, I think, leaders from the industry would talk about today. Then we will also talk about how do we um, maintain our, our, I think, so from when we get from a sustainability, we'll get have to do a lot of uh, maintenance work, which means that how do we maintain relationships? And I think licensing, the biggest problem is that you all work on relationships. We all work on contracts and these contracts can go south, you know, and I can tell you already, this has started happening. Uh, we're seeing people saying that, look, uh, uh, we have force majeure and we don't want to honor contracts and a lot of that would change. And, and there are some honest issues also. You know, look at retailers who have uh, stores being shut. They have merchandise lying from the last season, which is not sold. Uh, they would have no ability to even take their contracts ahead. So what is going to happen to this all thing? You know, how does uh, older licensees relationships the current contracts which are signed, uh, would, they, would they be honored for the years to come? Would the extensions would be given? How is going to impact the incomes and so on and so forth? And a lot of times you get uh, unwanted legal issues which you have to address. So this is going to be even more tougher, which I see is from the next three months, which is sustainability when you start getting into what I call the maintenance period. And then you would get to about another six to eight months by the time we start thinking through that what is going to happen. And then we will suddenly be hit by our growth plans and how do we continue to develop the business in that. So some would do this same phase, as I said, you know, they would, they would go to the first sustainability idea, then we go to a little bit of maintaining their relationships and then they would go on developing their business. Some would be clever. Some companies would be clever. They would do all three simultaneously. And that's something which is, which is difficult, but that's something which I always recommend. Uh, it's, it's all going to be, I call this, uh, there is an equation which uh, we used and when the lockdown happened, I sent this message to all my teams. I say, this is an equation called E plus R is equal to O, which means that the events would happen in your life and, and some events are out of your control. And this is one of the events which is out of your control. So this is an event which is happening. We cannot do much about it, right? And second is what to, how you respond to events which is absolutely in your control, how you respond to that. And that would actually be the O, which is the outcome. So the events plus responses we give them would give them the outcome of how we go in the market. And as a license industry, uh, we need to really also see how do we respond to this uh, situation which is arising on us. But overall, I, I particularly feel, I mean, uh, it would be shame if India didn't use this as an opportunity uh, for uh, maximizing our industry and licensing in India, uh, particularly because I feel that this has certainly made one big opportunity for all of us. The whole equation of China uh, as the key manufacturer for licensing uh, would change. Uh, and I feel that that opportunity, how we respond, again, I'm using this word with, with consciousness because we have missed on a lot of opportunities which came to us uh, and because our response was not that great. And how we respond, how we actively respond, go out and create that, that kind of capabilities and demonstrate that capability, demonstrate that transparency, bring some kind of, a, uh, you know, uh, better guidelines for, uh, you know, royalty protection, transfer, legal issues, a lot of other things which create comfort. I think we can take a pie of that opportunity, a pie of that merchandising opportunity which can come to India. <clears throat> so India can get uh, a benefit out of this. And I will also talk about a lot of other things which are, which are positively happening. You know, so obviously if you heard this uh, investment of uh, Facebook in, uh, in Reliance, uh, what is this investment about? Go oh, a little deeper into this. This is all about uh, they investing into the next digital commerce, which is going to happen to India. So this is end of the day. It's not investment. Uh, it just is a strategic investment. And if it is a strategic investment, it has to have a bigger play to for, for a Facebook. A Facebook or WhatsApp integrated 
is 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 looking at a commerce and where is commerce going to come from from the consumption which is based in india so consumption story in india is very very large <clears throat> and well i think we have really focused on our indian consumption story so if we are able to give greater responses and address that story right and and all the manufacturers exporters people who have always looked out uh if they start looking inward and start looking at opportunity of servicing this country i think there is a greater opportunity which is which is for all of us but <clears throat> certainly a lot of other changes would need to be done and we we say especially we work very closely with the retail environment both at our group level and i see a lot of changes would come in the retail environment and retail environment would change in all three uh, p's i call uh, one product changes a lot of product would change and significantly new products would be created some would be innovations i mean innovation like we are seeing uh, companies changing quickly i mean i was talking to one of our uh, fashion uh, export houses uh, you know and they've started making uh, this uh, uh, special uh, uniforms for airlines for which are personal protection uh integrated in that so so they have quickly shifted what they want to do on a immediate front i mean this is not going to be a, a long term strategy for them but on a immediate front uh they are looking for a lot of bringing a lot of uh, <clears throat> product changes and i i think uh every uh, uh company should think through and quickly turn around and see how they can build capabilities change capabilities bring uh some product changes to to address uh, the current current uh, demand cycle and then continue to change as the demand cycle either get regularized or permanently change <clears throat> second is processes you know our processes are very weak in india i think uh, one of the areas which we have always been let down in licensing uh, i use this every time because uh, we have very weak processes our go to market our capabilities to reach out is been extremely slow how we we are able to turn around faster how our reach is faster our go to market is faster that would be done because i will talk about in a later part uh, how i see the consumption changing so if that is going to change we need to cope up with our processes so that we are able to turn around faster we have very slow turn around cycles uh, particularly in india and third is the priorities the consumer would have how the consumer is behaving what is he looking to consume and one of the areas which i found uh, clearly which a consumer is looking at is what i call uh, two things in every brand and how Uh, license brands would be able to demonstrate that uh, that would be have to be seen uh, two things they look at is warmth and competence uh, how these brands are going to reflect in their communication in their story in their in their uh, product description and so on so if you are able to show these two things because uh, the current consumer is so conscious about what purchase decision they need to do uh, they are looking for a strong competence behind the brand and so people have actually moved from everything to very very competent brands uh, they would move back to uh, the procter and gambles and unilevers and likes of them because they trust them and they trust these companies even in in the spaces where uh, day to day consumption spaces if you see around people have gone back to very very trusted brands and and that would be a signal for next 2 to 3 years how you will able to give that uh, you know value uh, which is through your warmth which is your reflection how you you pass your values to the customer uh, by all the experiences both not necessarily physical experiences because people are not going out maybe digitally and second is how do you demonstrate the competence of your of your product quality and so on so so all this is is extremely important and companies uh, <clears throat> we would be able to show that kind of a structure uh, would change i also feel that in the whole space there will be a lot of consolidation uh, that's something which is uh, given um a lot of consolidation which means that uh, i feel that some companies would would aggregate more brands and and they would have better abilities to do that i i see independent uh, licenses might not able to sustain a uh, bigger companies which have multiple programs running and they have a large capability that back would be able to do that and i think as a licensors my advice to everybody would be that you encourage that consolidation so that you are able to protect the consumer market share otherwise you have uh, and i've seen a lot of great programs fail uh, because of the failure of the the licensee you know and the licensee was not able to sustain and the product was out of the shelf for some time and because the product was out of the shelf for uh, some time the revival of the product or the brand became even more difficult so if you feel that there is a a potential danger in in your product 
<clears throat> or your potential licensee or your current licensee, uh, then I would say encourage transferring that immediately to more, more structured, more larger player. And I feel that this could be a time where uh, bigger companies might become even more bigger and uh, smaller licensee player uh, operators might not be able to survive at this particular time. But there are a lot of good things are happening also, I feel, uh, but in a, what I call six to eight months term. Uh, and this would be um, like one of the things which the Prime Minister Office has, uh, or Prime Minister himself has said is uh, vocal for local, which is, which is a great uh, ideation to, uh, to give opportunity to Indian manufacturers and try to build products from India. And, but they will still need brands. So I think licensing is a great marriage to encourage local production and integration through a globally recognized brand. Uh, this is a great combination. You also fulfill the need of a, a consumer which identifies great global brands uh, and also encourage local production. And that's a great marriage. And I think that's a great solution for developing nations uh, because they would always have to uh, encourage local production. And, uh, and, and also it gives the consumer also gets a benefit of getting uh, global brand from that. So there's a lot going to happen on that. Uh, I think <clears throat> there has to be, and at License India also, we will like to also uh, put a lot of effort to uh, bring awareness because I think a lot of uh, uh, awareness is missing still. I mean, while we, we've been doing 15, 16 years of these licensing shows and various conferences and there are multiple other credible agencies like Bradford also all there, but there's a little done, you know, very, very little done from a penetration viewpoint. I think the much more has to be done collectively with all of us and including the association Lima. <clears throat> so another thing which would be very important that uh, shift I see is from a consumer side, consumer is uh, more than ever asking for a brand and, and some amount of reassurance uh, coming from, uh, from the brand side. So, and how those experiences would change uh, and how they want to consume uh, and digitally, especially because I think the large amount of consumption I see uh, would be experience at least from a, from a digital experience viewpoint and how the companies would quickly be able to adapt that. <clears throat> now, uh, another area which is, which is great at this moment is that we are consuming content more than ever. And uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, so there is a lot of opportunity on, on that side. I feel that there is a lot of new brands would emerge out of that content and a lot of IPs would be built. Uh, like I have not done, my wife was saying that there is a, a game called Ludo King uh, and uh, this has been downloaded by millions and millions of people. But so these IPs are built uh, in a in few months and, and, then, and this is a great opportunity time for a lot of new IPs which would get spread very fast and people would then like to uh, adapt to those IPs and, and, uh, and these IPs can be extended and so on and so forth. While I, on the other side, I see uh, even entertainment has got a big hit because new content is not being created. So we are uh, flushing a lot of uh, uh, older content and uh, <clears throat> because of all this going on, but I think we will find a way. Uh, one of our clients is WWE. They have actually uh, changed the format itself. They've taken the audience out of the, the whole format and they, they still started creating a, a lot of content. So people are becoming innovative. How can they continue to produce a lot of content even in the remote locations? So I think as they found their answers and, and ability to uh, survive in this situation, uh, we will start seeing a lot of content. But because of the just sheer demand of this content, uh, people asking for more, I think there would be a lot of new IPs. <laughs> Another opportunity in India, which is not being unlocked is the whole SME space. The SME space is very, very big in India. And I think uh, SME produces a lot of great product, but they don't get shelf space. Uh, because they lack uh, a credible brand on that. So I think a lot of programs have to be done to educate, train SMEs uh, for their brand, especially in the categories of FMCG, health and beauty, uh, a lot of those category, personal care, uh, uh, those kind of categories, and uh, even food space, processed food space, uh, you know, and uh, these kind of categories I feel would grow big time and the largest consumption for these licensee programs would be uh, SME manufacturers. <clears throat> Uh, direct to consumer, I think uh, most of the people who were adapted to the e-commerce side have already started facing the problem of uh, commoditization and uh, anything you're selling on commerce, uh, the platforms uh, would continue to put pressure on your pricing and your margins would continue to be eroded. 
So licensing is a great idea where, uh, especially in anything which you do direct to home or direct to uh, consumer kind of businesses, a licensing gives you that position to maintain your price points, hence improve your margins and, and ability. Another area which I see is an opportunity uh, is that uh, a lot of global players would start seeing India as a large manufacturing and a global licensing hub. I wonder why we have never attempted. Uh, I was called by one of the companies out of Bangalore and they wanted to take a couple of licenses for a mask and they want to sell it more so in Latin America because they had a lot of large operations of exports from there. So, uh, so I see there is an opportunity for Indian and larger manufacturers, larger uh, uh, companies uh, to take even global initiatives. Uh, while Exotica can be a single company which has all global eyewear brands, why can't uh, Indian companies, uh, 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 companies? I mean, Lenskart is a great company. Why can't they attempt to uh, take some of the global licenses and manufacture or produce for the world? And, and similarly, in a lot of other categories also, why can't we become a larger manufacturing? Uh, while we would always be a large consumption hub, but we also can become a large manufacturing hub, which has been always the strength of uh, China. And uh, <clears throat> I have nothing against China, but fundamentally I feel that as a large country, we need to have both markets going together. We would have to be a large consumption market and also a large uh, a manufacturing space. So, uh, categories obviously, which has a no brainer, anything which you consume digitally, uh, which can be entertainment, video games, uh, digital uh, content on demand, and things like that, uh, would be a very large space. As I said, uh, I, I'm a big believer that a big dollar would come from FMCG, uh, would come from uh, you know, fast moving goods. So uh, these are the spaces which would create much more value creation. And I also feel that uh, India, this is my last part of uh, the presentation. Uh, and I always, uh, in all my presentation on licensing, has always said that while we put focus on the global brands and we continue to bring these global IPs from India, but why would we not continue to build our own IPs also? Uh, <clears throat> so both in all spaces, in, in the corporate trademark space, in the, in the overall fashion space, uh, uh, you know, and uh, also in the entertainment space. Because we have a very large uh, global entertainment space, uh, which is available for us. Uh, we can genuinely create a lot of good IPs which can travel and, and can be taken to the world. Uh, we have also a very large uh, space for uh, what I call Indian fashion brands, I think we have genuine brands which can be presented and, and uh, if we are able to uh, uh, build the right program around it. And also we have a very large uh, heritage or, or iconic brands in India which have a great unlock value. So we use this uh, word literally called UEC, you know, so fundamentally this is three things which are required in any brand uh, which is now looking to extend. And this question normally brand owners ask me, that how, what should be there if you want to extend your brand. I call it three things. One, strong unlock value. You should have a very strong unlock value. Second, in India particularly, you need to have a strong uh, emotional connect. Uh, if you're not emotionally connected, the brand will never go. And that's happened to a lot of uh, celebrity linked brands which were extended, uh, lacked any kind of emotional connect. Uh, outside few, uh, which had a very strong, uh, you know, emotional bonding with their consumers, they speak the same language, they live the same life and so on and so forth. Uh, so it has to be. So uh, being human is very close to what Salwan is, you know. So fundamentally, while people at that phase of his life didn't believe, but uh, everybody knew him personally or anybody knew him, uh, what he does. So people thought that he, he was from, a, from that perspective had a stronger connect. So there was an emotional connect. And third is the credibility, the credibility of the product, uh, which is delivered to entire thing, just alone, extension of the brand would not make any sense. So if you are able to bring these three values, what we call unlock and build a, a strong emotional content and bring credibility, then I think there are a lot of Indian brands which can go in. We run in License India or Bradford, we run a, a LDP program where we actually work uh, and 50% of our time is actually now going on developing Indian brands uh, ready for uh, uh, licensing, not only in India space, but outside. I also feel that there is a lot of uh, personalities in India which uh, uh, are great IPs and they continue to create a lot of IP, but they have no ability to unlock that and how we can work with them to help them to unlock their 
uh, their their IPs. And I have I would leave you with the thought that fundamentally I think uh, uh, India has a great story. Uh, it would only depend on how we react uh, on these this particular time uh, collectively as an industry. Uh, if we are able to uh, uh, react in the right sense and we have the right responses to uh, things happening around us, there is an opportunity for us to to take rather advantage on the situation which has been put to us. And also, I think uh, collectively as an industry and License India and Bradford, we will put a lot of focus on what I call uh, made in India brands. Uh, so that's our space uh, which we would like to invest on. Uh, I feel that India should be ready to export some of the brands to the world uh, through licensing and that's my own personal focus area. Uh, so this is a little bit from my side. Uh, uh, I think there are a lot of uh, uh, valuable panelists which are coming in. Uh, you should take this as an opportunity to ask as many questions. So you have a Q&A box, uh, keep asking questions. I'm also available uh, anytime you want to reach me on LinkedIn. So I'm available for answering your questions or any other questions you have generally on the licensing or anything which uh, License India or Bradford can, can help you out. So once again, thank you for joining in. This is a four and a half session, but good part is you're sitting at home. You can enjoy your coffee, tea, uh, whatever you are, and keep listening to, to the content. There's a lot of interesting content coming in. So thank you very much from my side. Isha, if you're there, you can. Thank you, Gaurav, sir, for an amazing session. Uh, let's move on to the Q&A uh, section. Uh, can we have the audio from Abhishek Kumar, please? Sir, Abhishek Kumar's question is that Ludo King is an Indian brand and this can be the next candy crush when it comes to brand licensing. An Indian brand for global consumer. What's your take on this? Absolutely. I said that, you know, I, I uh, you know, everybody is talking about uh, the brand and everybody is talking about what has been created and I think uh, the speed of unlocking and speed of taking it to market would depend on uh, how you utilize this time uh, you know so uh, in the in the times we get popularity popularity is is very quick to achieve but how do we respond to that and how we quickly uh, and this is why uh, most of the licensing programs in India were not able to be successfully be able to do uh, by because we had uh, our our uh, reach to market was uh, took a lot of time. So if, if this has been picked up, everybody's talking about the brand and everybody is using uh, Ludo King and, and things are happening. So this is a time uh, you need to do and use that. And, and Bradford would love to talk to you. And if anything we can do together, I'm more than happy to talk to you. Uh, can we pass the audio to uh, Mr. Vijay? So Vijay's question is how we can, um, how can we make the house brands famous in India, especially in leather industry and SLG? How, how you can want to make a brand famous, brands are always, how, how do you want to create more distribution can be a question because if you are a famous brand, then only you can license actually. Uh, but yeah, so <clears throat> distribution is, is uh, critical and it depends on uh, uh, what kind of SKU is using and so on and so forth. And I think conventional ways of distribution, creating exclusive stores and all that uh, would rest for some time. I think the best would be uh, digital channels and the uh, digital channel can be any uh, e-commerce companies and commerce e-commerce companies are very proactive in licensing. They all, uh, you know, are looking at newer ideas. And I think India is still very, uh, uh, you know, at least in leather goods, uh, very interesting market. Uh, we hardly have brands and I think we have only uh, three or four, uh, so to say, credible Indian brands which are available and the market is absolutely available. <clears throat> so there is a big opportunity in the land goods. I will tell you, uh, there is a license in India which has a global license for cross for leather goods. Uh, so they don't only do uh, cross uh, for India. India is very little market for them, but actually they do it globally, especially uh, travel retail. So all the airlines, when you go there, you will find cross products. Actually, they're all produced by a licensee based out of Calcutta and then distributed across uh, markets.
Now, can we have the audio from Mr. Paul? So the question is, what is unlocking value of brands? Unlocking value of brands, uh, as I said, unlocking uh, uh, is actually about what you can extend on that brand. What is the DNA of the brand? What it stands for? Uh, you know, for example, we do a brand for JCB, uh, which is Earth Movers. Uh, there are, uh, you know, stands for, uh, obviously they are known in the construction industry, uh, but they are very robust machines. They stand for durability. They stand for so we really find the DNA of the brand, and then categories which would fit them uh, would be natural extension. So maybe a battery can be a natural extension. Uh, maybe tires can be natural extension. So these are these are how you extend the brands. You know we we are we are discussing on a very interesting brand called Old Mark. You know it's a classic, a uh, great brand. Uh, and uh, if you if you extend that, what you would extend, what it stays for, uh, which target group really reflects on that brand. And so we, we work a lot on on doing it, and it's it's about uh, <clears throat> a deeper study on on the brand and the consumer group, and also some kind of a, a, a deep dive in the, their DNA, and then extend that to relevant categories. Anytime you want to go outside relevant categories, and a lot of times you just because the popularity of brand try to get category which makes no sense, uh, it's normally a disaster. So it's a licensing test works if you if you really stay focused, pick up three or four categories which really are absolutely relevant for you and maximize that. Any other question, Isha, for me, or we move to the next? Yes, sir. Uh, one question is from Vishwa Mohan. How do you see the Indian brands in K-12 education space performing? Indian brands in K-12 education. This, uh, this. Uh, so I, I, Indian brands for K-12 education school consumption, which is back to school, or, or if that question is is relevant to that, I think yeah, that's a very big market. It's always been one of the largest markets. Uh, uh, for consumption this year would be tough uh, because we are not consuming so much. So I, I feel that a lot of uh, uh, merchandising which would be prepared to be offloaded uh, in India uh, when the schools open or before the schools open in India. So uh, I feel that there would be a big pain and pressure on people. So uh, while kids would go to school and then and they would still need newer backpacks and newer water bottles and a lot of other things. Uh, I think some people need to do some innovation and I'm very sure the e-commerce would start opening up and, and some consumption would work there. So if, if people produced that or I think so a lot of this, this year would have a lot of pressure on people to move their current merchandise and how they bring uh, liquidate that. That would be a big challenge for at least for this season. Uh, I think, but in times to come, that's a very, very big market. Uh, again, our, our distribution is weak. Our, our product, uh, uh, our capabilities to bring product on the shelf is extremely poor. Uh, I mean, even if you ask now, uh, if my girls both, uh, whenever I go to London or I think they know stores in London and they know stores in other parts of the world and they tell me exactly what store you need to go and buy what needs to be done. But they, because they don't find those stores here, they have no affiliation on, on international market. They have affiliation on the, on the product or the brand. Uh, because those are not available here, uh, you know, so they would obviously remember what they have. So, so we have again the problem is in distribution. So unless and until we fix that problem, and <clears throat> we have a very clear availability for a consumer where to produce and get these products, uh, I think otherwise India can be one of the biggest. Uh, if answering your question, K twelve uh, merchandise market in the world. Thank you, Gaurav sir, for an amazing session. Uh, the rest of the questions will be answered offline. Absolutely. So now let's move on uh, to our first panel discussion, which is on the big picture India focus, how entertainment will spin into new territories. This session will be for around 45 minutes, followed by the Q&A for 15 minutes. Let me introduce our speakers for this session. Preeti Vyas, President and CEO of Amar Chitra Katha, Private Limited. Uh, Tej, Tejonidhi Bandare, COO Reliance Animation, Nitin Karla, Director Animation International, India, 
session moderator Francisca Ash, publisher, Total Licensing. Thank you, Francisca, for being with us. Over to you now. Good morning. Hi, good morning, Francesca. Good morning or afternoon, of course, as it is there. Yeah, afternoon to us and morning to you. I, is everybody here? Yes, we are all here. Yeah, we're all here. Obviously, we're going to do this as questions, and there's so many questions at the moment coming out of the current situation. So I thought we will start with that. Most of the world really has been under lockdown for the last two months, on and off. How do, do all of you, or each of you in turn, think that's going to impact on, stop my video, on um, the way forwards, on licensing, on consumer buying? Do you think it's something that will change the moment that the lockdown is out and people go back to normal? Or will this stay um, moving forwards? And the same with viewing habits. So really, if we could take this one by one by one of you, I'm sure that'll actually add some interesting points that no doubt people will have questions on. So maybe we could start with Nitin. Okay, good morning to you, Francesca. Hi. I hope you're doing fine. We're good, thank you. Yeah. Uh, great to be on this panel uh, with Preeti and Tejo. And uh, uh, yes, of course, the licensing world, as Francesca just mentioned, uh, has, has turned topsy-turvy, just like many other businesses around the globe. Uh, we are not, um, we are not in this alone, as, as everybody is saying it. Uh, but at the same time, yes, I think uh, from a point of view of the business per se, which is so heavily dependent on uh, retail, uh, definitely there's been a massive, massive impact in terms of the consumption. Uh, specifically talking about the Indian marketplace, uh, yes. since this, this unfortunate incident happened uh, just at the start of the back to school season, uh, which, uh, which was to start around the end of March and then go right up to uh, the middle of July, um, you know, the, the biggest challenge has been there was a lot of stock that was made and that was sitting with the, in the warehouses or it was sitting in the, in the inventory pipeline, uh, which is not going to see the light of the day. We have so many licensees now who are talking to us practically on a daily basis with requests about how can we help them liquidate this stock because there's no way for them to sell this stock at this point of time because retailers, retail is still pretty much stuck, uh, closed in, in India. Uh, there is consumption on e-commerce and you know just to raise a point where, where you asked about would people get back to shopping um, I was reading a re research report which came out just a couple of days back uh, where both Amazon and Flipkart have actually said that their uh, order values are actually back to the pre-COVID times uh, in India ever since they have uh, they have opened up a delivery of non-essential goods as well because during the time of the early lockdown, which was phase one, two, and three, uh, only essential goods were, were allowed to be delivered, oh, okay. yeah. right? But now the non-essentials are also allowed. And in the last 10 odd days, they've, they've seen the first week itself, they've seen a sudden spike in categories like kids wear, for example, uh, which, is, which is very interesting well, well, well. from our business point of view, because that works really well. Uh, clearly, kids have been sitting at home and, uh, uh, you know, uh, sizing has changed for a lot of them. Uh, there's more consumption of clothes because they're not going to school. They're sitting at home. Obviously, they're, they're taking, they need different clothes every day and they, they are looking at a sudden spike of clothes. Similarly, we've seen reports where they've said that toy consumption has also gone up uh, in the last 10 odd days. Uh, but all of this is restricted to e-commerce. And mind you, e-commerce is still a very small portion of the retail business in India. It's not a very, very large business. Uh, oh, okay. yeah. uh, things might change in the future. Definitely we believe e-commerce e will have more uh, offtake in India, but traditionally India has still, tra traditionally India is still a very, very mom and pop store uh, model where you go buy stuff from your neighborhood store um, or, or you go, go to the mall and you buy things 
physically, you touch and feel uh, the product. So uh, clearly this year, uh, in terms of our evaluation of the business uh, has been that uh, the entire year is from a consumer products point of view is totally wiped out because we do not see anything significantly moving in the next few months. Uh, uh, largely, really, as long as that. Yes, largely because of the retail uh, lockdown. Plus, even if the retail lockdown is is over and things uh, open up, which we hope should open up soon, uh, there'll be a lot of scare for people to go out there in the marketplace. Uh, the other thing is, we deal with products related to children, right? Yeah. And obviously, kids is is one category which is ex where parents are extremely careful before allowing their children to step out. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, technically, we are not allowed to actually take our children out as of now. I mean, any children really? under 10 years, we're not allowed to take them out. But even if they open up and they allow, I mean, I don't think so. Parents like us would, would want to risk uh, mm -hmm. a chance and say, okay, let's go to the mall and, and you know, hang yeah. out. Yeah. Them, or let's go and do shopping from Hamleys or whatever. We'd rather do it all. Yes. So a lot of things are changing uh, from the business perspective, uh, things will evolve. There are partners who are already talking to us about digital licensing, which I know we're going to talk about in a while. Um, gaming has suddenly become a very big uh, area of interest for everybody. Um, there's a lot of digital engagement that's happening with brands. Yes. Uh, we see when, when it comes to our brands, uh, whether it is uh, an Albert Einstein or a Charlie Chaplin or a, or a Doraemon or a Shin Shan, uh, we, we see that uh, now brands are more talking to us on digital engagements. We, in fact, have deals that we've signed during the lockdown period, uh, wherein uh, certain agencies have spoken to us and certain brands have spoken to us for exclusive digital campaigns. So they will not take it on product. This will not go with on, on pack. This won't have an ATL campaign. BTL is obviously out of the question, uh, but this is purely digital. So it's an emergence of a new form of licensing that's coming in and, and we are happy, we're excited to see uh, a sudden shift to focus that has been brought about uh, by this unfortunate incident. Uh, but uh, we, in our company, we are, we're taking it very, very um, uh, with an open heart because we believe, you know, at the end of the day, we're all human beings, we have to evolve. And uh, we're taking it in a positive sense that, okay, if, if one door is closed, the other will open, right? So yeah. it, may, it may take us a little while to reach where we were pre-COVID, but I think um, uh, we're headed for exciting times. And it's a matter of just hanging out there, uh, you know, ensuring that this year goes by without any, any uh, major calamities or any dramatic uh, turns yes. of the, the businesses. It's, it's all about hanging in there and then uh, reviving it, hopefully reviving it back from next year. Yeah. Tijani, would you like to tell us how, how you see life so, during and after the pandemic? So I would really categorize this discussion into two parts. One has already been covered by Nathan, uh, which is the flow of uh, the IP that goes into uh, merchandising. Uh, for us, uh, for the companies who are developing IPs, it's uh, very key how you develop more and more good IPs and uh, whether it's a pre-COVID, COVID or a post-COVID situation and how do you reach the correct uh, right eyeballs. So this is going to be the real key for us. Uh, there are a couple of challenges while we are working in uh, this situation. But the good part is our industry was always ready for a COVID situation. So our industry actually started, uh, most of our artists uh, started working as freelancers. Uh, while this industry, uh, uh, I, mean, I would say while this industry started uh, in India and yeah. we uh, primarily started as a service industry. So uh, we were already ready. Um, now if you categorize animation into uh, three parts, whether it's 2D, 3D or VFX, uh, 2D is more uh, robust pipeline which can be set uh, while working from home and uh, we have good opportunities to develop uh, more IPs in this in this particular situation when uh, people are having more and more time and yeah the key is going to be development of good IPs and then flowing it down to licensing and merchandising. Yeah. And, and Preeti, yeah. I know that you have 
obviously your publishers, I understand from our conversation before, how do you see life now and, and post pandemic? Yeah, so just taking off from uh, what Nitin was uh, sharing about, you know, new ways of engagement and new ways of, so I think human beings, you know, by nature, we are very adaptable species, you know, we adapt to change very quickly, we adapt our behavior very quickly. Um, but even in the situation like this, what would have taken maybe five or 10 years, we've seen that that change happening in two months. Uh, with content digitally, right? Something which was uh, which they could not uh, even dream of doing earlier, they're doing now. So, so uh, for us, it's been uh, uh, just like Nitin was saying, it's it's got its positives as well, and we're trying to focus on those positives. That there is, um, yeah, there's new ways of engagement, there's new ways of consumption, there's new markets which have opened up for us as a company. We were looking, uh, have been focusing on the India market. Uh, but last month, you know, we opened up our app access um, and gave a limited period of free sign up. And we've got like a huge, almost more than half a million new users on our apps. And those really? are uh, a, a, large, a large portion coming from uh, the rest of the world, from not from India alone. So that's been amazing. That's, that's really been something which is uh, very fortuitous for us. It's just a gift from the universe that's fallen into our lap almost. Uh, and uh, I think a, a new, uh, new digital uh, platforms opening up, you know, new collaboration possibilities. And from a consumer perspective, you know, we have been doing a lot of digital online workshops and things like that. So a space for far more, uh, a deeper, a more intimate engagement with your end customer. Uh, and, and that's also been um, a very good experience to be able to engage with your end customer in that setting and uh, build, uh, build that relationship. So a lot has changed. In it, I know it's just two months, but it seems like a different lifetime altogether. It does. And okay. uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, it actually looks quite promising. Uh, yeah, there is of course a lot of uh, uh, inventory which is stuck, and you know that's going to be a challenge to uh, to actually liquidate all of that. But on the digital front, there is a lot of action happening, and it's it all looks very promising. It's interesting. We've, I mean, digital obviously is is. A big key to moving forwards at the moment. Right, absolutely. After just just one point, because I know we talked about it before. Yeah. After nine eleven, very much a lot of the properties that were very, became very popular and were successful were very much home based. They were comfort properties. Right. They were heritage. They were you know, all of that in moments of of crisis. Do you see the same thing happening during this and after this pandemic? Absolutely. So if you notice, I mean, I've been noti looking at the trends. It's about in a time of crisis, you go back to comfort, right? Comfort yes. food, people are baking cakes and people are making dessert because, you know, you just want that comfort. You want that security. And, uh, you know, and we are seeing that as well because we are a legacy brand in India. We are a 53 year old brand. Uh, we are the custodian of the country's stories, you know, with um, mythology, history. Uh, and we've had two generations of, uh, you know, readers reading our comics. And uh, it's really amazing to see Francesca, the way consumers are engaging with the content now. So while we have been struggling as book publishers to get people to start reading on digital platforms, you know, a Kindle and all the uh, eBooks have been a very small percentage. They've, uh, but in the last two months, we've seen this huge spurt. And um, I'll, I'd love to share a small uh, example uh, that came yeah. in. Uh, one of our, uh, the parents who wrote in to say thank you for giving us access to your app, um, they said that they are you she's using this mom is using the screen mirroring function of her phone uh, to project our app onto the screen onto the tv uh -huh. right as a comic book and the entire family she's saying it's become a daily ritual for us after lunch uh, the whole family so mommy daddy and the two kids we sit together and we read one amachita katha comic every day after lunch and then we oh, wow, wow. <laughs> We do voices and we, we discuss it afterwards and it's become a very precious, beautiful experience as of a family bonding together. Yeah. And yeah. to us, it's absolute music to the ears because otherwise a comic book is a very intimate experience. It's one person reading one book. But here we have the whole family being able to read together and enjoy and that's possible because of technology, right? And this mom figured it out on her own. We didn't put on any, any uh, news announcement saying do this. It's just an instinctive mm -hmm instinctive human tendency to want to adapt and to try to find ways. And um, so I think for legacy content for, uh, for us, for, uh, the whole uh, 
the whole reason why why are so many indians from across the world connecting with amachusa katha again it, like you said it's a comfort it's the stories i grew up yeah. with it's the stories i grew up with i feel warm and fuzzy and safe when i read these stories and i want to connect back with them yeah. and i want my kids now to connect with them as well of course so Nitin, yeah so it's Nitin, new markets opening same. sorry the nitin do you see the same trend if you like I think out of the whole panel, uh, Teju and Preeti both actually are owners of of brands which uh, which are pure Indian. Uh, as a company, uh, I think I'm the only one who does not have an Indian IP on board, and we we represent okay. international IPs around here. So I'm the odd one out here on the panel. Right. Uh, having said so, uh, uh, whether people will will continue to or whether there'll be a spurt of people going behind legacy brands. i think um, yes and no okay uh, and i'll explain to you how and and what our experience has been uh, yes because there's a certain uh, pattern of uh, you know of of nationalism that comes in yeah. at some point of time where people suddenly feel very nationalistic or patriotic and say oh, i'm going to buy something which is indian i'm going to use something which is indian something that has been that has been advocated by the prime minister himself where he said that let's give a chance to indian brands okay yeah. uh wherein uh, these indian brands have to have to go out and then make it big on the global scale and he specifically mentioned that brands which are today being consumed in india whether they are from the uk or from from the us or any other european mm-hmm. market or even the the southeast asian markets they all started off as domestic brands right and then they ventured out into another yeah. territory and then they started expanding whether it was through syndication whether it was through licensing or whatever so what he said was was actually something very true and something that makes absolute sense uh and and in, as far as that is concerned i believe people have started consuming more content uh you know Uh, Preeti gave a very good example about how she, um, how they have got into the digital workshop modules. Okay, yeah. and uh, just to let you know, my son actually enrolls for your workshops, and oh, he's, did he? he's actually yes. Oh so wow! Does, uh, okay. So uh, I believe you guys are doing something with WWF now. That's so right. That's right. So that's yeah. With... About joining that as well. Oh, so, fabulous! Thank yeah, you. Yeah. So, so the thing is, it's it's a new world that's that's emerging. It is. Uh, I believe that. while brands will benefit and i have always been a strong believer in francesca you would recall our conversations in in yeah. Vegas, in london many times that i've always been a believer that there is scope to do business for every brand right yes. whether it's it's indian whether it's global each one of us have our own strengths and weaknesses and uh, and the audience there's an audience for everything i mean you can't say that there's no audience for an x brand or a y brand Yeah. Yes, for some time, I believe people will continue to focus a lot more on the Indian IPs, and it's a great thing because I strongly believe that Indian IPs have been have been very less exploited, uh, let alone at the international level. I mean, even in our own country, you know, uh, there are very few Indian IPs that have really made it big. I mean, one of the examples, uh, I mean, what Tejo has created, which is which is Little Singham. which uh, which i believe has the opportunity to actually go global but uh, somewhere down the line you know even in the domestic markets while they've got success they've seen success but the scale of success of how an ip uh, you know how an international ip would actually be scaled up that scale has yeah. not yet come in right i would suggest that i would say that barring a chota bheem we don't think so we've got any indian ip that has really made it to the length and breadth of the world you know to all corners of the globe right. for that matter and and there is scope for tremendous number of ips i mean tejo is creating quite a few interesting uh, stories we know of companies back in bangalore which are creating some fabulous content at this point of time uh-huh. a lot of them have got global appeal and a lot of them i believe will make it make it uh, in time to come um having said that um how does that impact the business of the global brands i don't think so there'll be too much of an impact to be honest because each of these brands or if i take specifically an example of something like doraemon which is uh, which is amongst the top ips in india and it's been so for the last decade or so uh, even in times of crisis brands are talking to us they continue to talk to us in fact just yesterday we ended up renewing a licensing deal which we did not anticipate will get a renewal but the license is still very gungo about it because what people did was they've started connecting to the story 
of, of the character. So Doraemon is a futuristic robo cat. He's supposed to be born in the year 2112. And, and his message is very loud and clear that the world is going to be a great place to live in. It's just that we need to ensure that we continue to make the world a better place so that yeah. it's going to be fabulous when, when he is born. So, yeah. you know, people are now, the brands are now using that as a, as a storyline and as a peg and saying, oh, here is Doraemon coming and saying the world is going to be a beautiful place. So let's not cry over it right now. What's going through is a phase. It's going to pass. Let's let's make sure that we make maintain uh, whatever is required, whether it's hygiene, whether it's social distancing, and and let's pass through it together. Messages of friendship, with messages of togetherness, messages of yeah. of uh, you know compassion, empathy, family bonding. All of these are core messages of a brand like Doraemon, which coincidentally yes. this year celebrates optimism. its 20th anniversary. People need so, optimism. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. So. So, you know, I think there is this scope for everybody. Um, uh, Amar Chitra has a fabulous brand we've all grown up with. I think our parents have grown up reading it. We've grown up reading it. Our children are, are reading it now. So uh, these brands will definitely, these are more brands which we believe are traditional. They're part of our legacy. And we should be, as Indians, be able to promote it more. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, which, which is the need of the hour. And I think... Yeah. This situation has taught us that 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 is something that we need to be uh, we need to take it up as a as a mantle and then move forward. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and but but there's there's business for everybody according to yeah. me. I mean there's there's nobody uh, can say that my business is gone or yours is less yeah. or no. I think yeah. we all have our own strengths and weaknesses going forward. Yeah. And every, everything is changing, so everybody yeah. changes. Yeah. Absolutely. What, did any, what do also, you think, Francesca? What do you yeah. view it? Yeah, taking uh, taking a cue from uh, Nitin. Uh, I think we have all grown up uh, uh, watching and listening to stories uh, of Amar Chitra Katha or Ramayan and Mahabharat. In fact, our industry IPs started building on uh, mythological characters. And if you have to discuss uh, uh, or if you have to put this discussion in layers, uh, as Nitin said, uh, the TG uh, that to which we cater to actually relates to the character. Right. The character and the stories around this character. And we have to very much stories in India to tell. Uh, it's just that we are not leveraging right now. Or uh, it's just that we are not going beyond India. Uh, the scaling, as uh, Nitin was mentioning, the, the scaling is uh, a big challenge at the moment. How do you scale up the IP beyond India uh, is going to be the key. Uh, yeah. Then there, is, then there are a couple of other layers like uh, the, uh, the OTT versus the television and uh, how do you reach out to your right target audience uh, in this current situation. And one of, the, one of the greatest things that we have seen right now is how DD1, DD, the national channel, surged to number one uh, channel in this COVID situation, uh, airing Mahabharata and Ramayana. So there are... Uh, there there are viewers and there is a uh, consumer for all the domestic stories that we have. Uh, it's just that we have to reach out to the right target audience and we have to scale up our IPs uh, so that we can reach out to the international market. As well. Interesting. Obviously with the, the, I mean, the pandemic, I know we're stuck, you know, we tend to stick to this subject because it's leading to so much, but a lot has changed in terms of entertainment. The movies have been delayed or postponed or cancelled. And that makes a less organised, if you like, campaign for licensing. Because if you knew a film was coming out in six months, you have the campaign, you have the product ready, you have this. Now everything's changing all the time. How do you think the industry generally, or how do you think licensees will adapt to this changing, do you think movies will become less important? Uh, and maybe with a, with a view to digital properties and influencers and all of that becoming more important? Pretty, perhaps you have an idea. Yeah, well, I, I think that, you know, storytelling, right? Yeah. What we are essentially doing is telling a story. So whether it is through a, uh, through a movie or through a book or through a web series or whatever platform you're on, it is eventually selling a story yes. and selling that content. And uh, with the pandemic and people being stuck at home, and as Nitin was saying, it's not going away in a hurry. So no. I don't see 
in six or twelve months that we're all going to be going out to a mall and watching a movie with four hundred other people. That's not going to happen, <laughs> right? But that does not mean that our consumption of stories is going to go away. Our consumption of content, in fact, is going to go is going up because sitting at home, that's all people are doing, right? You're just watching more and more movies and shows and reading books and you know playing board games and doing all of that. So. uh i think as licensors the people who have that ip the the challenge is to quickly pivot and say where is my consumer sitting how is how is the yeah. consumer engaging and what can i do to uh, to fulfill that need because my story still remains the same it's just the platform and the vehicle which is changing so uh, and and that can actually throw up a lot of interesting like even from a marketing perspective you know when you're talking of how do you market yourself um we had a character one of our most uh, famous characters is a character called supandi and uh, it was supandi's birthday in april uh, and we had obviously had a, a huge offline campaign plan but everything had to be scuttled we did actually a whole online campaign for supandi's birthday we had a supandi birthday party on zoom we had about 400 kids joining in and beautiful <laughs> engagement very very high quality engagement kids were drawing kids were laughing kids were you know we gave them uh, uh, we gave them a return gift which was a subscription to our app and it was a beautiful engagement so there is it is still possible to to create you have to be creative you have to pivot quickly the workshops which we spoke about which we are doing it's a new property altogether so that's a new licensing platform available uh, we're collaborating with wwf to do one of these and we we are seeing interestingly a lot of brands who are interested in in coming and being a part of those uh, workshops and we've had uh, people even from like kids from across the world so we're actually doing a batch now at 10 pm india time because we have kids from uh, the us who want to take part in these workshops really yeah so we're doing a night batch which starts at 10:30 at night india time so we can get those kids to join and so um, it's really about stretching yourself and then in a way the pandemic has brought us all to- together as well right because we're all in it together so yeah. there's also that and sense of going that Yeah, we're all going through the same thing, and you know how can we make it? Um, you know how can we actually come together and try to get our stories across to readers and to consumers wherever they're sitting. Do you think with movies, like obviously the big budget movies? I mean, DreamWorks went one and launched Trolls directly on pay paid for you. Right. Uh, they bypassed the movie theaters, and that seems to have given them more revenue than yeah. they would have got if they'd gone through movie theaters, which right. obviously is a is a sense of what they could be doing in the future. Do you think that's a way forwards? What do the panel think? What do you think, Nitin? It's, it's actually happening here in India as well. In fact, we have uh, we have a um, uh, you know India's largest superstar, Amitabh Bachchan's movie that's releasing on on uh, I believe on Netflix or Amazon Prime on one of the two uh, platforms next month, and it's caused a big uh, um, the, Euro, a big yeah. scare in the in the uh, theater industry. They in fact have yeah. written. Yeah. Uh, letters uh, to the government uh, seeking a yes. ban on something like this and they they've appealed to people not to uh, watch the movie on ott and wait for it to come on cinemas um i think what what this situation has done is actually opened up something really astonishing and i i would like to talk about this a little uh, a little historically uh, you know i was part of a a, a team that actually uh, premiered india's first movie uh, online on the same day when it released in theaters oh wow way back in 2001 i used to work with a company called ratri productions which is one of india's oldest uh, production houses movie houses and uh, we had in 2001 started working on um, uh, ratri's digital uh, platforms uh, which were launched eventually in 2006 and uh, the day it was launched it was also the day when one of our uh, one of our uh, big budget movies was released in the theaters so we actually partnered with uh, uh, with youtube at that time and set up uh, a parallel uh, youtube uh, i mean we actually had our own website sorry ratri.com where we actually ensured that the movie was available for download for around 10 dollars uh, right. on the same day as it was oh. launched in the theaters it obviously created a big uh, not such a big noise but definitely a big noise amongst the industry people that time so why would something like this happen but i i also want to tell you that way back in 2006 we may we had around 140000 downloads of that movie really uh, each one paying us about 10 dollars uh, 
uh, which which actually incidentally was a larger revenue than what that movie made in the theaters. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's so, how uh, DreamWorks found with Trolls. Yeah. So so you know when I when I actually hear about this and at that point of time, um, uh, you know the person who was heading that business, um, unfortunately, is no longer there. He he passed away. But uh, he was a visionary, and he would always say that there will come a time that the screen won't matter. Yes. And like he said, it is all about the content. Yeah. It should be the consumer who needs to decide whether I want to watch this movie on a big screen in the theater or whether I watch, want to watch it on a mobile phone or yeah. on a laptop. Or like Preeti said, where there is where the people would want it, I mean, they take a, a projection device from yeah. their phone and they would do it on their on their yeah. walls. Yeah. Yeah. People find their own ways to yeah. access content. So um, I don't think so that accessing content, yes, certain industries will still jump up and down like the theater owners have been doing right now. But I think uh, content owners will sooner or later realize that their job is to make content. Their job Absolutely. is not to decide yeah. How the consumer will consume that content? Yes, right. I mean, it's a very different thing. From yeah. I, I often, I often actually joke uh, amongst our team. We have a joke that maybe twenty years from now, if there is a way to stream content directly from our server to the consumer's brain, we should be able to yes. do that as well. You we know? don't know whether that will yeah, happen. That potentially, it probably yes. will. Yeah, it will. It will really happen. And we should not worry about whatever, whatever way the consumer wants to consume our content. We are happy to give it to you. In that, it's just a vehicle. It's Absolutely. just a vehicle. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what this is then going to do for people, companies like us, and, and as Preeti said, and as Tejo said, um, from a marketing standpoint, yeah. this will actually give us a much more focused way of doing business. Absolutely. Because today, as a licensing company, our problem is if I go to a, a retailer, and I don't want to name any one of them, otherwise they all will come behind us. <laughs> um, uh, because they all are the same, actually. Not, but anybody you go to, the first thing they'll say, oh, the so first question is, oh, which channel does it come on? Okay, fine. You are on a channel. So how much are you going to pay us for the shelf space? Right? Yeah. So retail, unfortunately, has become a real estate business and not a consumer business anymore. Right? They're not worried about what the consumer demands. Yeah. They're worried about their retail space. They're, okay, I'm giving you the space, you pay me for it, and that's about it, right? Now, the dynamics are going to change. So today, uh, for example, I have uh, 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 I have Doraemon and Shinshan, both my shows on Disney+. Plus. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. nothing stops me from actually, uh, you know, reaching out and, you know, through... through Facebook advertising and through, um, you know, Instagram advertising, Google advertising, one is able to target consumers who are looking for that content, right? So if I'm looking for Doraemon content and if I land up on Hotstar page, I know this consumer is looking for that content. So I can do a, a target advertising to him to say that, okay, Doraemon merchandise is now available on, let's say, Amazon or, or on my own website. Right. So in fact, I now have an opportunity to reach out directly to the consumer that matters because he's yeah. the one who's consumed my content yeah. and he's the one who's likely to buy my content. Number one. Yeah. Number two, it helps me reach out to those areas and markets where these stores are not physically present. So we've seen, there was a report uh, uh, about 10 days ago, we were reading that during the pandemic, in the last two months, the consumption of internet has uh, has gone up is higher in the rural areas in india than in the urban areas oh that's interesting it's a very interesting twist of turn that has happened in this yeah. market that now more and more people in the rural areas are consuming the internet accessing mm -hmm. the internet content rather than people in the urban areas so you know that opens up a huge market for us Cool. which was not tapped by any of these re these retailers for that matter. Yeah. That's where we are foreseeing that, that our new market will emerge. That's where e-commerce companies are going to become very, very active. Uh, you know, the, any business, and I've been, I've been an advocate of this, and I've been saying this to everyone, that a business that does not have a digital footprint or a way to survive digitally has, has no reason to exist in this world at this That's point. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So if you don't have a digital uh, way of making money, I mean, yeah. I was surprised at the way, uh, you know, Preeti and her team put together that entire workshop modules. I mean, uh, the charge that they do is reasonable. 
uh, but the content they put together is fabulous. Kids love it. Kids have a yes. great time. I mean, it's a new money making opportunity. I mean, two months back, three months back, if you told somebody I'm going to do yeah. workshops yeah. online, yeah. people would say, oh, what the, what the hell are you talking of? Right. Yeah. So, um, but now I've got malls that are talking to us. We're saying, can you do workshops for our, our patrons online? Online. Oh, interesting. We are getting people who are coming to us, brands that are coming to us and saying, would you want to do workshops for us online? Right. Okay. Yeah. And, and Zoom and you know Google Meet have really opened up. Uh, oh, they have. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> look at it. We've about this before. Yeah, I mean, imagine every year we would meet thrice a year in various licensing yeah. shows around yeah. the world. I mean, who thought we would be sitting and chatting with each other and having a fabulous conversation here Absolutely. on Zoom, right? Absolutely. And it's extraordinary. And we it's haven't had to go there. It's, yeah. it's even better. I mean, of course, but see, the people-to-people -people touch will always be special. But you know what? Yeah. We've been there. We've done that, right? Yeah. So we wouldn't mind <laughs> skipping a year because we know next year is coming and we know we're yes. going to sit and have exactly. a next year. Maybe every other year. <laughs> yeah, maybe early, yes. Maybe. And the, the, the irony is that all this was always available, right? But yeah, because but of never... this, that, yeah, you're forced to start using it. I mean, we've more, used more Zoom in the last two months than any of us have in our entire lives, right? It was, it was always Absolutely. there. It was always there. It's not something new. Yeah. But yes, but we've just learned how to use it now. The key, is, the key is go, sorry. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, the key is going to be how do you keep your uh, target audience engaged? Absolutely. Yes. How do you uh, run the engagement programs, whether it's by way of workshops or um, any activities that we do? Uh, it's just that the engagement is going to be uh, the long term uh, uh, I mean, ingredient for the e commerce business as well. Absolutely. So, really, it, the content becomes even more important than it was before. Right. Because it's not the way you're consuming it. You're not sitting in a movie theater or, yeah. or out with, with other people. You are only consuming the content. The, so the content the only, really the is only caveat, The only caveat is that at the moment, there is so much stuff which is free online, right? Every yes. major zoo, every museum, uh, you know, every wildlife safari, everything oh, is yeah. free. Yeah. So in that environment, that was the challenge that we faced. That in this environment where there is everything is free, every Broadway show, I'm looking at them all free. How do I get parents and consumers to pay for my content? That's right. Enough. In in any case in India, getting parents to pay for digital content, anything online is a challenge, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's uh, they tend to go to YouTube and want free stuff. So yeah. how to, that is anyway a challenge. But now in this environment where everything is free, how do I get them to pay? So then that's where the challenge comes up. That as a as a IP creator, as a content creator, I have to deliver a very high quality experience. And something so different, something, and something different. Free. And yeah. and the challenge is that parents, uh, the brand name is strong enough, they'll sign up the first time. How will I get re sign up? Will I get repeat business? Yeah. So today we are in our 10th week of workshops, and the same people are, are, are renewing, are re signing, which to me is the best news ever. That means we're delivering, we are delivering a high quality experience, otherwise, it doesn't work, right? It's a, it's a gimmick, and you'll, yeah. you won't be able to take that, take that further. So now this becomes a a, a, a sustainable line of business for us in the future. This is not just for the pandemic. We'll continue to invest. But that is in also that content is absolutely key. key. Absolutely, absolutely. It's not the experience. It's not the experience of going yeah. to a mall or a right. theme park or anything else. Exactly. exactly. It's the content. Absolutely. How does social media fit into any of this in India? I think it was already there. Social media was, was always there and it, it continues to may play a major, major role going forward as well because uh, it's it's critical to reach to get the word out there, and like Preeti said, uh, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of free content out there. There's a lot of free content out there. There is. Uh, so so, you know, getting of getting into that whole exercise of funneling down as to who my target audience is or who my consumer is, or how do I reach out to the relevant consumer is very important. And I think one more thing which I'd like to add on to what Preeti said. Uh, is is the fact that this particular property, like the digital workshop property, let's say what she's created, is actually now um, you know open according to me to to brands um, and more and more brands that would want to engage with these with these customers. Absolutely. Because it's very clear that uh, that brands are now also going to keep looking for newer avenues. To, to promote and reach out to their end consumers. So if yeah. they look at the engagement piece very strong, 
Uh, and of course, content has always been the king and content will continue to remain the king. Yeah. Uh, assuming the content is still there and it's very strong, I don't think so. Brands will hesitate to jump onto the bandwagon and say, so today, uh, you know, ACK is doing their own workshops. Tomorrow, I don't see a, a reason why, uh, let's say, a Cadbury's or a, or a, or a Kraft Foods or, or yeah. even a McDonald's would not want to come and sponsor it for that. Yeah, absolutely. And and then it's, give up give out way away. of promotion. Yeah, of course. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So uh, it's a matter of creating that channel. And there, I know like how I got to know about their workshops was through social media. So there you go. So yeah. Clearly, yeah. social media plays a very, very serious very important role, role in terms very of important. how you reach out to your end consumers yeah. and end customers and tell them what's happening. And thankfully, we have technologies. Uh, we have uh, Google and we've got YouTube and all the tools are available today to tell you where your customer is sitting. Yeah. So I think that's going to be critical and, and, a, and a key factor going forward. It, it was always, always there for most of us. We were always using uh, social media to reach out to our customers. Now it's going to be all the more relevant. In fact, I've been having chats with a lot of agencies and a lot of brand managers in the last few weeks and everyone saying that, you know, our BTL budgets are completely gone because, you know, there's no BTL possibility at this yeah. point in time. Yeah. So where has all that budget gone? It's all gone to digital. It's all gone to digital, yeah. It's all gone to it digital. Is. It is, so, because that's so the way, the, that is a way that you can communicate with anybody anywhere. Yeah. No which, is unusual, I mean, no. which is unusual anyhow, eh? I mean... And the, the other advantage, uh, um, Nitin, I don't know if you're experiencing it in Francesca, that one is... Uh, because of the inherent democracy and the open source nature of the internet and of social media, uh, even attracting talent, you know, you're, uh, so many independent uh, artists, illustrators, independent uh, storybook makers are coming out uh, and we have our app. So we are actually on an app. It's very easy to host someone versus yeah. print or versus a physical product. We have to invest a lot of money to actually give somebody a chance. Uh, on my yes. app, it's possible for me to say, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll feature your, your work for three days. And that gives freshness to my content. That gives my consumer something new to look at. And it's actually giving so many, so many creative people in the, and indie artists a place to you know, really shine out and not be, because they're hidden, they're well-kept secrets. And this gives them a way to yeah. also come out and, and share. So, gives them a platform. Yeah, absolutely. Fascinating. It's just that, uh, uh, just to add to both of them, it's just that the positioning of uh, the brand has to be right. Because our target audience is not there on social media. Uh, their parents are there. It's their parents. Your yeah. positioning has to be right uh, to reach out to the right target audience. How do you position what, like the workshop? So how uh, would you do that? Allowing that, as you said, the parents are on social media. So you target you have to, the parents and hope it then to, goes down? So the, uh, you have to attract the right... Uh, uh, I mean, the parents that are watch, uh, that are wanting the kids to watch the right content are our source to reach out to the right target audience. Yeah. Am I audible? It it's targeting your audience in the end, which is much easier to do digitally than it is physically. Um, I think we've got to the point now, probably, where we need to take some questions. Um, I'm not quite sure how this works. Yeah, we'll move on to the uh, Q and A sessions. Can Thank we you. have yeah? Can we have the audio for Mr. Shekhar Chopra? Go ahead, Go Shekhar. Uh, take your question. Yeah. Hello. Hello? Do you have yeah, a Yeah, Shekhar, go on. So I have actually raised the simple question that how, what is the future for, you know, uh, kids content, uh, be it live or animation, uh, OTT versus broadcaster after COVID because a lot has been changed because you can't do the production part and animation also people are struggling. So how do we see the kids content? I mean, because all the broadcasters and everybody, either they are playing old content or either they are shying away from having a new IP or something. They're just repeating the content because kids' content has a lot of repeat value. Going forward, is there a future market for new content? Immediately. Yes, there is. Yes, there, 
yeah shekhar yeah i think there is definitely a market in fact if you have seen most of the reports that are floating around uh, animation is the only industry that's actually sustaining this uh, exactly. covid situation exactly. uh, we are the only industry mm-hmm. probably who are uh, doing the production at the highest capacity uh, for us if I, we have to say we are doing it at 90% of the capacity that we have right now and uh, yes the key, uh, the challenge is going to be for some of the processes that we have like the voice over or the music uh but uh, people Look, are finding out ways to doing uh, to do the animation because uh, see all the major all the major players whomever we are talking to whether they are internationally based or national they all have said that uh, we've been told to put any new project on hold and kind of you know stay put they either either yes, they have they just changed they will definitely have their I see the broadcasters will definitely have their own challenges in terms of cash flows yes. because advertisers are pulling out Yes, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, so to say, there is a war between the OTT and the broadcaster. But yes, exactly. uh, for animation, I would really say that uh, TV will still uh, prevail for a longer time because of the scheduled mm. broadcast, mm. scheduled time, the the fixed timing that that they have for the broadcast, which actually kids also. their parents as well uh, because then they have other activities to do uh, they would have their own classes schools and other activities to uh, which which might go on even in the uh, covid situation uh, that's not the real war for uh, the animation uh, sector and it will yes definitely take some time for the broadcasters to come back while uh, the the market open up and uh, advertisers come in with their digital uh, uh, licensing or Uh, digital ma- marketing public publishing uh, and any other activities that they would want to do on the broadcasting front uh, uh, my, my, just a question of time yes. and and it's not looking at new content they are looking at new content well, great thanks a lot guys thank you thank you Can we have the uh, audio for uh, Mr. Parikshit? Hi. Hello. Hi, hi, Parikshit. Yeah, please go on. Hi. I think actually Preeti has already answered my question, but I just wanted to thank her for making ACK uh, free to all the parents and kids. That was brilliant. And thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. and we'll certainly keep looking forward to seeing more ack assets in education related collaboration Absolutely. similar to these by juice we have a lot of exciting things happening in the pipeline and I can't wait to share uh, them with with all our readers awesome. and, and as far as the, the free apps goes uh, parikshit we got back so much love i can't tell you the it was uh, i think whenever you give a gift you always uh, the giver gives more than the re- gets more than the receiver yeah so that's that does definitely true in this case as well so thank you for Very downloading well, it thank you thank you can we have the uh, audio for mr mh vakil please un- unmute yourself and ask the question you have the audio now yeah uh, it's for uh, mr mh vakil could we have the audio for him i'll ask his question uh, he wants to know that what license is required for brand registration in india as they have uh, as he has started selling the products on his own brands he has already started selling on e-commerce site and also wants to start his own e-commerce site and how should he increase the sales for making the brand very popular in india and which license is required for brand registration nitin do you want to take this one uh yeah so so firstly i think that question is a little ambiguous because we don't know what brand is he talking of and uh, uh we don't know what kind of product uh, uh do you sell but um uh, as such what you require is basically to go ahead and i've lost the sound nitin we are not able to hear you no 
Is it audible now? That's Pasha. Yes. yes. Now. Hello? Yes, Nitin, well, you're audible. This doesn't happen at the licensing show, right, Nitin? <laughs> no. <laughs> Just to answer that question, there are, uh, so uh, typically there might not be any registration that is required for any brand assets, but there are a couple of other things that one needs to do like a trademark registration or a copyright registration for uh, for the items that they are creating and that should be all ideally can we have the audio for mr amir I'll ask his question. Uh, when we say that, when we say three most important factor of a brand success depends on having a strong unblock value, emotional value, and credibility. How can we promote an international brand in India which is not emotionally connected with the audience here? So actually, Nitin is the best person to answer that question because that's exactly what they have been doing. Do we have Nitin back on? So maybe I can try and answer that. Um, that I think eventually it again comes back to what uh, Francesca was sharing earlier about content being king, and the the long long success of uh, of Disney properties or whether it is a uh, uh, Doraemon. Okay, Nitin is back. Nitin, I was answering the question on your behalf. So sorry, sorry. Am I audible now? Yes. Yeah. So I finish your point. No problem. Yeah. So all I was saying is that there are successful. We already have so many uh, examples, whether it's a Doraemon or it's a Noddy or it's a Disney characters who managed to endear themselves to uh, Indian mm -hmm. audiences as well. Mm -hmm. It all comes down to strong storytelling, great production, and being able to form a bond with the child. That's I think it comes down to that eventually. Yeah, Nitin. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you've covered most of the points, but I was referring to something related to the trademarks, which is essential. Uh, to be able to kind of do that uh, from a point of view of uh, taking the trademark registration in various categories. That's what we're doing. We are, we are on the second question. Yeah. I think you. Um, I, I skipped a question. question. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, you so, skipped so, a question. So the, the question was, Nitin, that how does. Uh, uh, Characters and IPs which come from abroad, how do they make an emotional bond with an audience where the uh, where they don't have a natural affinity to the storytelling or to the content because oh, it's, it's not from there. What I I caught you saying that it, uh, it's all about the content and creating that emotional connection. I think that's yes. where that's what is the most important. Right. And and uh, any content that comes from abroad, uh, the first thing it does is is connects with the audience through the television. Yeah. I think that's yeah. critical. Yeah. Uh, and now, obviously, through uh, through a lot of other uh, platforms like YouTube, etc. Yeah. As long as you're able to connect back with the audience, I think there's there's definitely a market for everything. Yeah. Not just a market. There's actually a need for it. You know. Yeah. So uh, there's a very beautiful yeah. analogy that I had read about all content uh, essentially being either a window or a mirror. Yeah. So either it's a mirror to your own reality, or it's a window, or or it's a window to somebody else's reality. And for, and, you know, and for the holistic, especially for children, for a holistic development of a child, you need both. You need the mirror and you need the window. So you need the Indian connect, you need the Indian content, you need your mythology, your history, your stories. But you also need Disney and you also need Doraemon and you also need that. Because that's what enriches the child's life completely. Absolutely. One of, one of the classic examples is Oggy and the Cockroaches. Yeah. yeah. It, was, it was a content without dialogues. And then they added dialogue uh, to the content with Indian voices and made it successful in India. Yes, there are. I mean, there are a lot of brands that do travel worldwide. Yeah. You know, brands from all over the place. Brands from Russia that have been successful in Italy or yeah. a lot of different brands are successful. They connect with children are still children wherever they are. Um, and certain things appeal to them and quite a lot doesn't, you know. Yeah. Yep. We have the next question. Yeah, we can we get the audio for uh, Mr. Nagraja? 
Yeah, hi, uh, Nagraj here. I'm an IP and legal expert. My question to you, all the panelists, I heard you about the brand licensing and other things. And also, of course, there's a lot of merchandising and other things associated with it. Uh, basically, my question is, why are you, what, what is stopping you guys from going international on the IP side? Maybe it is on the copyright, maybe it's on the trademark, maybe on any other aspects of IP. What is stopping you? Is it just the, uh, you think you're only connected to the local audience or do you think you're not connected to the global audience? So, See, I would like to answer this question. Uh, we essentially in India, animation started as a service industry. Since then we have been doing service work. Uh, it took us time to build our own IPs. And even today we are uh, a little weak on the pre-production side. We are good at storytelling. We are very weak in pre-production. Uh, it will take some time for us to grow to that level, to, uh, to tell stories to the world at an international level. And that's where uh, the uh, challenge is while you take your Indian stories international. Uh, the scale, the scale of op uh, the scale of operations and the scale, uh, the scale in which the IP has been built uh, is the key. And we are still yet to reach to that level. Yeah, as far as the publishing industry goes, Nagraj, uh, I'm, I'll speak about ourselves. Amachita Katha and have been global for the longest time. I mean, we've been there for decades together, not just the Indian diaspora, which is of course huge. There's 18 and a half million Indian diaspora on the US alone. So that's a huge market already. But even otherwise, beyond the diaspora also, we've been selling our comics in, in Portuguese and Spanish and French and Swahili and Afrikaans and Mandarin in all the possible languages. So uh, again, good storytelling uh, crosses boundaries and there's, yes. uh, if, if at all there is a scope to grow, it, the, the challenge has always obviously been for Indian homegrown companies, financial, uh, having the financial uh, muscle to actually reach out because the Indian market itself is so huge. Uh, but now with the digital world uh, taking precedence, uh, reaching consumers globally is going to become far, far more uh, easier, yeah. faster, yeah, cheaper. Yeah. Do you, think that will, do you generally think that will mean more Indian properties will succeed outside India? Absolutely, 100%. Because we have a 5,000 year tradition of storytelling. So uh, it's part of our culture and it comes na very naturally to us. And we are in the sector of storytelling. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for answering the question, both of you. Thank you, Nagaraj. Can we have the next audio for Mr. Uh, one second. Mr. Visha, Ms. Vishakha, please. Yes. Very nice. I'll ask the question. Um, Vishakha, Vishakha, unmute yourself and ask the question. You have the audio now. Vishakha, can you hear us? Isha, go ahead. Okay. So the question is, how do you guys, uh, what are your opinions on creativecommons.com? And what are, uh, what are you guys budding fashion designers register their brand? How do you guys budding fashion registers their brand? Wait, could you repeat Nich that? Nichin, are you there? Yeah. I was going to say, do you want to? Yeah. Uh, I'll repeat the question. How yeah. do you guys, budding fashion designers, register their brand? And what is your opinion of creativecommons.com? Okay, so um, firstly, I'll, I'll take the question about uh, the fashion designers. Now, according to me, uh, any brand, whether it's a fashion brand or a kid's brand or any brand for that matter, I'm in the process of going ahead, uh, creating the brand and Registering it is pretty simple. You go ahead and get your trademarks in place, start using the brand, start designing something, go ahead and sell it. Um, and, and you'll be able to scale it up depending upon how your, your brand is received and how your, uh, uh, your customers are, are buying your brand or not. Uh, not every brand that is created uh, can be extended into licensing and merchandising. Um, it's not possible that everything that we that we produce and every every brand on earth can be extended. 
because every brand has its own ethos, his own, uh, you know, uh, plus pluses and minuses. So uh, really depends upon what your brand positioning is. And I think Tejo mentioned about this in some, uh, in one of the previous answers that he gave was, it's all about brand positioning. Uh, so it depends upon how you position your brand, which area you want to go in, whether you want to keep it premium, whether you want to go mass, whether you want to go mid mass, uh, depends upon how you want to kind of go ahead and, and plan your, your brand extension. Uh, coming to creativecommons.com, um, honestly, I'm not aware about what that is. Maybe Preeti has an idea or Tejo has an idea, uh, but I don't know what that is. So I will not be able to give you any comment on that. So um, the Creative Commons license allows, uh, is where uh, content creators allow uh, for their content to be used freely. Uh, under that license, it can be adapted into any format, any, uh, any medium. And um, there are very successful brands, even out of India, like a successful property like the Story Weaver, which came from Pratham, uh, which uses the Creative Commons license. And um, that's amazing because I think the number of ideas and good ideas and good content is always a, a 1 million X multiple of what we can afford to put out commercially. And certainly every one of those ideas and every one of those stories deserves to be heard. And the creator deserves to have a platform to put it out. So uh, Creative Commons is great and uh, we should encourage it. And wherever it is properties where we don't see a commercial uh, potential immediately, we should make it available under the Creative Commons license. Can we have the next question audio from Ms. Anum Kirk? Is Anu Garg? Anu, just unmute yourself and ask the question. Maybe you could read the question. Yeah, I'll read it. Um, Amar Chitrakatha's uh, plan for extending their brand into STEM and STEAM products, similar to Disney and Baiju's? Question to Preeti, ma'am. I'm not revealing my plans on this webinar. You'll have to watch the market and see what comes out. <laughs> no, jokes aside, there's, uh, we are in the edutainment space. So we will obviously be using uh, storytelling as, as our main medium to do anything. But you'll hear more about it as in the days to come. All right. Thank you all for sharing your valuable insights on this session. Thank you all the speakers and the Thank audience you. for having this wonderful Thank session. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very all. much. Thank you, thank you, all. Thank you Francesca. Thank, thank you, thank you, Francesca. all of you. Good to, good to see thank you. you. Yeah. Good to see bye, you. Bye, Nitin. You. See you. Bye, 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 bye Preeti. Bye, bye, Nitin. Bye. Now let's move on to the second panel for the day, which is on how corporate brands and lifestyle assets will make over to address new consumer experience, global perspective. This session will be around for 45 minutes, followed by question and answer for 15 minutes. The speakers for this session are Mr. Samir Modi, founder and president of 27 Modi Care Kalobar, uh, Kyron Klohl, vice president of global marketing and head global brand licensing Electrolux, Roberto Bri, CEO, private collection and co Marie Claire Paris, Mark Bezondis, managing director, licensing and international development, Perry Ellis International Europe. The session moderator, would be Christina Angelica, Editor-in-Chief, Licensing Magazine. Thank you, Christina, for being with us today. Over to you. Um, I ask to the organizer to allow me to turn on the video. I can be seen. Okay, here I am. Uh, so thanks uh, for the organizers to have invited me for uh, this session and also thanks to the other guests that I don't see them here, all of them. So I would ask uh, to Roberto and uh, to Samir Modi, Kiran Coyle and to Mark to show themselves if they can. Here Roberto, Kiran, hi Kiran, how are you? Uh, hey, Christina, I'm good, but uh, 
I, uh, it's the organizer who's muted my video. Okay, so now I can see you and I can oh. hear you. Okay. Okay, perfect. Mark, I see Mark and uh, hi, Mark. And hi. Samir, hi, Mark. Where is Samir? I can see. I'm here. Samir. I'm here. Hi, how are you? Samir, hi. So I, we have to be very honest. It's everything is really live, and so we it will be very it will be a very open discussion on uh, how uh, corporate brands in this session we will talk about corporate brands are uh, facing this very uncertain period we know very well how things are going globally and we know how all the every part of the world that has reacted uh, since January and now is reacting nowadays to uh, this uh, uh, virus and also how it, it is impacting very strongly on uh, everything that is uh, about brands and customers in particular. So, so the uh, customer approach to brands that is affecting a lot. Um, so now we will have uh, um, a discussion with the panelists on how every single brand they are working on, they represent, uh, is uh, facing this period. One of the big challenges, I would say, of uh, uh, these days is uh, how we have to face uh, a kind of uh, new approach uh, of uh, how brands communicate uh, through their customers. Uh, so I would love to share this very first question with these uh, uh, speakers. And uh, uh, I will uh, follow the order of the speaker session. So I will ask uh, to Samir Modi first to go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Christina, for uh, the introduction. I feel that in the new, the new you, brands will have to re-engineer themselves completely. Uh, Artificial intelligence, virtual reality, uh, social media are going to become prime. And how do you touch your consumer is going to be the most important factor that's going to happen. No longer are, are people going to be concerned by coming into a store. Be more, more and more people are going to look to a web experience. And for example, my companies today, especially Colorbar Cosmetics, developing an AI and virtual reality that customers can get the same experience online that they will get offline. So online, offline, or you call O2O strategy will become very, very important for brands. Yeah, okay. And so what about, uh, uh, of course, I think that the digital and also online experience is one of the main topics of all the uh, brand owners, licensors, and also licensees. Uh, Kieran, what about your experience uh, with the Electrolux in terms of uh, uh, brand communication in this period? Yeah, I think um, for us in the, uh, in the group, because we have over 70 brands in the group, so uh, each brand, I think as I mentioned before in the, in the previous session, each brand of course has its own identity. And the uh, communication must reflect that. But I think, you know, I think we need to consider, you know, the, not just the brand, but you know, the, the, the trends. So you know, we've got work going on within the group looking at trends actually by market uh, as a direct result of COVID. Uh, and those trends have kind of developed uh, starting in kind of January, February through to now from in many, many markets moving from kind of, you know, fear and, and anxiety uh, through now to kind of limited acceptance as, as markets start to open up. And we've seen then a move towards more trusted brands. So the more trusted your brand is, we've seen the, the move towards that. We've also seen the move uh, globally actually towards more mid-market brands as well, brands that maybe will develop and deliver kind of a bit, a bit more value as you know, uh, economies recover because the amount of disposable income is not there. But really brand by brand within the group, of course we have Electrolux, but we also have Frigidaire, which is a huge brand in North America. But in North America, there has been no drop off in demand. Because in North America, uh, first of all, Frigidaire is in that mid market position, but also the retailers where we sell have not closed. And that's often the many big boxes of some, you're familiar with Lowe's and Home Depot and others, they've stayed open. And if you compare that with the fashion industry, where a lot of retailers, Neiman Marcus, JCPenney, 
um, J Crew have, have gone into bankruptcy. The fashion industry has suffered, you know, greatly. And then if we compare that with, um, you know, the trends where people are, for example, cooking more at home, obviously, because they're spending more time at home, uh, where actually we've seen a move towards a more sustainable eating and more sustainable living. And if we look at trends where people are looking at uh, new ways of being hygienic. So our air care business, our water care business, our floor care business um, have all had a, a great boost. Um, interest, interestingly, people are cleaning more, but doing laundry less. So go figure. I don't know, but certainly they are interested in, you know, how they wash, how they clean. So looking at those trends, the effect, you know, the economic effect, the move towards trusted brands. And then, as was mentioned, actually, in the, in, in, in the previous session, the move to online. People now are much more comfortable buying online. They're much more comfortable, actually, if we look at uh, some of the research we've done in Asia, a lot of seniors, what we might describe as seniors, have moved to buy online with confidence, whereas in the past, they would have been maybe a bit reluctant to do that. We now have got to make sure that not only do we have the right offering to meet the needs in terms of the changing trends, the changing economic conditions, but also that we can service online, that people are able to make the right selections and that we have the distribution set up. And that can be particularly challenging in, in, in different markets. So really, as I say, there's not, a, there's not a one size fits all answer to this. It's really combining uh, from a brand point of view, from an economic point of view, from a distribution point of view, retailer point of view, but certainly there's an opportunity on the licensing side because we as a company, again, without disclosing too many plans, may well move to license categories. And in the past, you know, we would have, we would have either made ourselves or sourced ourselves uh, because we uh, want to focus maybe on certain core products, which is a smaller range, a more focused range than maybe it was in the past. So those other products which consumers demand, but maybe are not the most economic for us, we'll now consider for, for licensing. Yeah, I think uh, you have touched so many issues and so many aspects of this. Uh, I think a big thing, um, it's of course a big revolution. I mean, nothing would be as the same after what we call the new normal, no? and even we don't know what will be the new normal. And for the brands, I think it's exactly the same big challenge. So I totally agree with you that it would be uh, something very new for retail and for distribution and also for uh, the way they will approach every brand. And as we know so far, the online uh, uh, e-commerce so was already a big trend but now is the main way that the customers feel safe to buy uh, instead of going to retail. As you may know, in Europe, uh, um, some retailers have started back to open, and, uh, but in any case, they are pretty empty, empty as well uh, because uh, uh, customers don't feel safe to go to make shopping again. So, Roberto, what about your experience with uh, Marie Claire uh, uh, communication? As the brand Marie Claire is communicating to, the, uh, to their customers and fan base? Sure, sure. Uh, thank you for thank you for inviting me. And uh, I, I, yes, I can I can say what Marie Claire is because what Marie Claire is means, means exactly what Marie Claire is doing. First of all, Marie Claire is a content generation, is a media, is a publisher. So, is a publisher uh, dedicated, committed to to women? Uh, just two key numbers. 80 million women across 27 countries, just to give you roughly an idea. Uh, of course, uh, Marie Claire is very well known for its brand, and, but even more, is very well known and reputed for the quality of its content. So what Marie Claire is doing now is just emphasizing on content quality. This is certainly what uh, Marie Claire is doing and is constantly doing since 50 years. Of course, uh, the big change is in between print and digital. For a media group, print is a, is a real issue uh, and is a real issue during lockdown, for sure. On the other hand, uh, digital communication has becoming fantastically, um, fantastically promising 
and with, with a fantastic opportunity to introduce new content, introduce new devices. So this is basically where the group is. But coming to our uh, licensing business, uh, this, is, uh, this is exactly the opposite. I would say that uh, licensing business for Marie Claire, as uh, often happens, uh, is uh, product derivation, uh, product brand, branded product derivation, and uh, content and communication is where eventually there is a lot to do during this pandemic era and even more in the near future. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, uh, so what about... I can, I, I can be more specific, but I don't want to, 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 keep, to keep too much time. <laughs> also, to, and also to catch all the questions that I will not do <laughs> then. <laughs> so then, uh, Mark, if you can tell us also about your experience. Yes, typically in our career. Sorry, we, we, we have some. Okay, so yes. Mark... Uh, <laughs> So, Mark, if you can tell also about your experience and point of view. Now, we are talking about how brands are communicating through their customers in this period. Sure. Um, so, obviously, um, Perry Ellis, we're a global business. So, we operate literally in every territory globally. And we're in a, a fairly unique position where we're a retailer, a manufacturer, a licensee, and a licensor. So, this really, this storm couldn't be a lot worse if it tried as far as we're concerned. Um, but looking to the positives, to, to many points already made, as a brand, it's all about communication. We've seen um, double digit growth online with our online stores. Um, and where stores have started to open up again, we are seeing significant um, year on year growth. So just to, you know, we, we've looked to Europe, Germany has already opened, France, some stores are opening now in mainland Europe as well. We're aware that Primark, for example, opened last Saturday. It did 26% up year on year. It's averaging out at 12 points um, up on a year on year growth. So we know there's a pent up demand within the market. We know that certainly some of our brands, when communicated in the right way, um, there's an opportunity um, there. This is gonna be a, a real volatile um, three to six months where brands kind of level out. Some brands are gonna disappear uh, and that's really, really sad, but that is unfortunately the truth of the matter. And some brands will come through um, to a point that was made by one of my um, panelists earlier. I think the, the older brands, heritage brands, as we probably call them in licensing, they are in an extremely strong position. Um, they're well known within the market. And if they can communicate in the right way um, with the right emotion and empathy, then this is, there's an opportunity there. So really what we're doing as a group is looking at the different, the different pillars of revenue that we have from online to in-store and content and trying to make sure that they're communicating in the right way as and when the markets open up. So as I say, China's already open. We're seeing Asia coming online. We're seeing some revenue bringing up. Europe's back. South America, that's a whole nother challenge. America open, but to the point of an earlier speaker, it's the bigger big box stores. So opportunities there, but in limited numbers. Um, but really, I think for the most important thing for us at the moment is the communication is constant and relevant and with a t with the right tone because ultimately as much as you can gain in, in markets like this you can also lose i think a really good example is if you go back to the 80s i don't know if any of anyone's old enough to remember that but back in the 80s we had a significant um, recession and ibm continued to advertise and market aggressively in that marketplace where everyone else at that time started to pull out of their marketing spend and then what happened was when the market came back IBM boomed. I mean, they did significant growth in a short period of time because everyone looked at them as a trusted brand and a trusted, um, op and a trusted kind of operating system. And, and that's exactly what we're going to see now in the next three to six months is gaps are going to appear. And if you're right about the way they communicate and that you touched in the right way, there will be opportunities. Obviously, I'm aware that there are significant challenges still ahead of us. And unfortunately, I really don't think that we've, we've seen the, the biggest waves yet. Um, but, you know, I think if we hold on, hold on tight, then, you know, things will be all right in the end. 
Great. So we are already collecting some uh, questions for you, but if you agree, we make first uh, a round among us and then I share with you the questions we have from our audience. Uh, the other point is uh, after we have talked about how communication has changed for brands, I would say that another big issue for brand owners and also for big licensors is how they should or how they are working on new business models because as far as we know everything has changed so also the business somehow is affecting from um, everything that is happening now and will happen then and so also uh, if and how have you approached new business models of course to your business so samir i will start again with you can you just read the question sorry so, how have you changed, or if you plan to change, your business model? So, we have actually shifted our business model to be more e-commerce led, uh, rather than more off offline led. So, earlier we used to do about a 15% business online, and now we're looking at doing almost 50% business online by bringing virtual reality, AI, by actually bringing our, our beauty advisors online rather than offline. So that's a very big change for us. Okay, but don't you, don't you think that in the future, hopefully, uh, I think that as soon as possible, let's say by the end of the year, hopefully, we will be back to a kind of a new normal. And so also when we will be back that we can be, again, free to travel and uh, go through shops and, uh, um, I mean, to act as before. I mean, we will again be free to travel right. and by uh, also in that case, you will go ahead with this uh, strategy. So I, I agree with you that the new normal is gonna come later this year, or probably next year. But at the same time, online is gonna become very, very important. Because during lockdown, all we had to do was online shopping or online browsing or social media. So people who are not adept to using the online channel have now become adept and they will continue to use that. And therefore I feel that online will be very big. While offline, we're taking all the precautions for sanitization to make sure that the touch points are, are sanitized, the consumers feel safe. So the combination of both that will change in the new you. The new you will definitely have a, a stronger presence of online. And that's my honest view on, on going forward. I understand. So, okay, Kiran, uh, so now we, we see you in front, it's much better. Yeah, I <laughs> I keep moving the camera around. I've got two cameras and neither one was working. So, uh, wow. okay. you know, so, uh, and two cameras is too many for me. Future, the case of the future business yeah. model, the change of business model, is it something that is also, um, I mean, an approach for you or is something you won't consider? No, I think, frankly, anyone who doesn't consider a change in business model uh, doesn't understand what's happening. Um, we, we're approaching it from... Uh, from probably three different angles. Uh, and again, bearing in mind that, you know, we are a big group, we're, we're in, you know, 150 markets, uh, 75 of those markets, we have licensed product as well. So we're not necessarily approaching the licensing different from our, our core because, you know, a licensed brand is a, uh, for a consumer, it makes a difference whether it's licensed or whether it's, it's made by us. So let me briefly say then what we're looking at. We're looking at, first of all, from a brand point of view and brand desirability. And that's a direct reflection of the fact that people are moving towards more trusted brands, as I mentioned a moment ago. And driving brand desirability is not, not a simple thing. You know, it's not a simple thing. And uh, we need to be much more active uh, online with our messaging. Um, it does vary market to market. But I think you know, that's not an area that we have focused on. You know, a lot of our brands are 100 years old. They are kind of strong heritage, well-known brands. But the important thing with brand is when people are buying is top three consideration. If you're not in the top three consideration in a market, when people are first thinking of what they want to buy, then the odds are that they won't choose your, your brand, All right? There are impulse buys and other buys, but essentially, you know, pretty much all research shows that if you're not in the top three consideration, you're going to struggle in a particular market. And especially in, our you know, core business of appliances, which is highly competitive. So that's our first area of driving. It's uh, the relationship with our brand. And we have, a, we have a certain advantage in this current situation because uh, you know, unfortunately a lot of people have been confined to home. 
And a lot of our brands are all about the home, whether it's cooking, it's laundry, whether it's floor care, air care, water care, a lot of our brands and our licensed products are about the home. So it's reinforcing that messaging. The second area, which, is, which we were already moving towards before is data and analytics and spending a lot more effort and energy in understanding the buying patterns of our consumers, existing consumers, understanding the whole consumer journey uh, and at which point decisions are being made. And that's both online and offline, because I think as we all know, sometimes people would look at a product online, then they'll go to the store and you know, kick it and tap it and twist the knobs, and then they may buy it there or they may buy it again online. So we need to have that seamless consumer journey online and offline. Um, and we need uh, to kind of use our data and analytics uh, more commercially. So we spend a lot of time now on the insight side and on understanding our consumer and making the consumer actually the heart of the business model. And then lastly, um, digital. We uh, are already moving as a company to improving the whole online experience of our consumers. But now we're building out the online platform side, either what we offer ourselves or our other partners. And you know, we're all familiar with what are some of the strongest online players uh, around the world. Uh, and working with them. Now, that was something that was challenging years ago because our uh, bricks and mortar retailers, our offline retailers, often resisted us moving online because then they saw it as a competitor, right? And we've all had that experience where you can get a little bit of resistance from your older customers, retailers, who uh, may be a little angry that you are moving online and maybe feel competing with them. But in this new reality, that's where our consumers are. And so we need to be there too. We need to be online and offline. So those three areas, Christina, are the areas that we're focusing on now to refine our business model. And then overall, just be more focused, more laser sharp in the, in the, in the business. Yeah, <clears throat> I totally agree with you. So what about uh, Roberto? Yes, I, I think... Uh, I would, I would like to talk a little more about uh, what's going on for Marie Claire in India. I believe our audience is uh, specifically listening to it. Huh? Mainly Indian and I, I think also some European as well. Yeah. Mm -mm. Okay. Uh, first of all, of course, we are all working on changing attitudes. Uh, somehow it's funny what we are seeing at the TV. And Christina, you know, because... Uh, we have been in a phase two in Italy, actually approaching phase two in France. And what you see is dramatically comics and ridiculous. So back to normality means exactly what we didn't want to. Back to normality is packing the squares, packing the bubs, packing the restaurants, queuing, yeah, fighting in the car, is, and so on. We want exactly what it was before or we want something different? <laughs> so, so this is not what, changing attitude means to me. Mm -hmm. uh, what means to me, and is really, and is really the focus, is uh, to understand how social, social issue can uh, impact on consumer choice. No? Basically, uh, how, how the changing of attitude could impact on uh, going to buy my product uh, now related to before the pandemic and eventually after this time. So my point is that uh, in, uh, we are in licensing and we are licensing fashion uh, through Marie Claire brand. We're licensing fashion, we're licensing beauty, home interiors, up to hospitality. Uh, in India, we're pretty young. Uh, we are just a few years old. So uh, in some other areas of the world, Marie Claire is licensing the brand name since over 30 years. So with, uh, you know, different approach and different uh, maturity, I would say. Uh, in India, we have a fashion, fashion accessories, and 100% online business model that we will keep. But of course, what I need to introduce is uh, what is called workshop, what is called uh, experimental workshop. This would be something new to introduce uh, because it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity to get in touch with the client in a new physical way, I would say. When I say new physical way, 
you know how frustrated we are in terms of uh, physical contact through because of the pandemic time. So to understand how to meet with your customer, to meet physically with your customer would be a fantastic opportunity. I think that uh, an experimental workshop will be in, uh, will be organized as um, what is, what we can say, a list of special projects. Uh, with our fashion partner, beauty partner, or home or interiors or up to hospitality partner. I think special project would, would be the lecture of what, has, what is changing and what is going to be the change. But of course, uh, I would add something more. Uh, I have a nice point that uh, come to my, my mind during these last weeks because I'm working on a new project and uh, I, I have been focusing and uh, introducing new project through uh, what the brand would bring as a positive contribution to his community, to his society. So this is where I see uh, Marie Claire uh, going and of course there is uh, there are I have few, if we have some time, few real and concrete examples that uh, we, can, we can discuss. But of course, uh, this is basically in the end is a positive contribution is my key for the future. Uh, rethinking the behavior through workshops, through special projects to enhance local culture, to enhance local uh, um, craftsmanship, to enhance the local uh, territory, communities. This is what I have in mind. Yeah, I think that in particular, the value and the content of the brand is what will make the difference in the future. As also Kiran said before, um, the customers will go where they trust. So if they trust on that brand is what they will uh, what they will buy. So they won't buy simply a consumer product. They will buy uh, a group of values uh, and uh, positive messages that also in this period will make the difference. So much more than before. Um, okay. That's true. That's true, but the price point. Your time. <laughs> See. <laughs> Sorry, but the price point is going to be key. To Kieran's point, yeah. mm. I mean, the, we, as brand owners, we can talk and, and give the right message. Mm. But price is going to become more sensitive, certainly for the foreseeable future, than it has been since the, the financial crash. Um, and I think that's what Kieran made a really good point earlier about there are certain brands that, can, that will have an opportunity um, within the market because of those price points, because certain brands just won't be able to come down and compete. And, and that is going to be an interesting, in terms of the world of brands, it'll be interesting to see how that interacts and, and, change, and things change around that. Sorry. No, 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 Mark, I was, I was right asking to you, your opinion about uh, how, if, and how you will change your new business models. About prices, if I can just say, I totally do agree with you. I mean, the price will be a key choice uh, for uh, uh, customers, but... I can also say that in certain territories, quality also is a key. So, of course, you know, it's always a cultural matter. So if you go to see how, which is the German attitude. So for German people, the price and is always a key point and they prefer to have basic products instead of very stylish products, but the important matter is the price. If I think the key, the key word is value. Yeah, yeah, uh, the, the, that is, uh, but also, for example, if I compare to France and Italy, for example, just to talk about two markets where fashion is a key, uh, quality somehow is more important than only the price. Of course, uh, also price, so the, the comparison of both, so price and quality together then make the very final difference. But what about your opinion? I mean, uh, for you, I mean, for your company. So how, if and how are you working to change your business model? I think um, 
for us online, it, we've mentioned it many, many times, is, is now critical. It's always been critical, but it's more critical. Um, one of the interesting things that's happening is, is that social media has become even more of a, of a, 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 a challenging environment, but also the opportunities are, are huge because social media in terms of influencers, the, the influencers that you can now get access to um, in terms of price points is, is changed dramatically. Um, because obviously there, aren't, there isn't the volume of work there. So we've started working with more and more influencers now. We're looking in terms of retail, we're looking at how we can work with the queues because people will have to queue. So that actually brings an opportunity because if you can use technology to interact, you can do discounting, you can do vouchers. There's all kinds of ways you can use technology with people that are, that are waiting to come into your store. Um, be that through collection, collection in store, so it, I think there's, op, there's opportunity, there's new touch points that are coming about that we're looking at from a retail perspective. Um, and then from wholesale also from SMUs about utilizing the tech that's online. To Sammy's point, people are not gonna wanna shop as much, but they are gonna wanna shop. So we've been looking at experiential as a huge driver for retail. And we're now accelerating those, those plans. Um, obviously challenging because of the, the financial um, situation we find ourselves in, but People are going to want a reason to shop. I think if you look at the, the shopping malls that have been built over the last 10, 20 years, the mix was 70, 30 entertainment. And now, certainly the malls that I've been working with in the Middle East, the mix is flipped. It's all about getting people to come and do things and entertainment based as opposed to retail based. And we're going to see more and more and more of that because people aren't going to simply want to go to a shop to buy clothes anymore. It's much, they need many, many more reasons now. So Sammy's right in what he's saying, and it's how we look at that from an experience perspective, utilizing the guidelines that are in place to make sure people remain safe, but at the same time, capturing that customer when they're anywhere in, in relation to our brands or our stores. Okay. Um, then uh, uh, Mark said also about retail. Retail, of course, is a key point. Everybody is talking about going online, of course, but uh, the traditional retail, if you want to call that in that, in that way, uh, somehow has to survive in the future new normal uh, world. Uh, so how you are considering to help, to support your licensees partners and also your eventually retail partner also, or in any case, how do you see licenses and retail partnerships that can go ahead in the next future? Going beyond the online, I mean, we have already said that online and digital will be key, uh, but so let's talk about your perspective in the future. So the support to licenses and uh, uh, retailers. So Samir, again to you. My, my big, uh... My big thing is going to be that irrespective of the way things are going to be, I feel that safety is going to become a very, very big, uh, very big important aspect for, for marketeers, retailers. Uh, they will be here to stay, but safety is going to be very important. And the experience they get is going to be very different. For example, I was in a, in a garment shop three days ago, and I couldn't try any, any clothes on because they said that the kind clothes is, is not allowed any longer take the clothes home, you have one week to return them. So uh, I think those challenges are gonna come prop up in, in retail and it's all about how we handle them. Uh, we, are, we are, I mean, I run three businesses, one direct marketing and two are hardcore retail businesses. Uh, I'm finding that touch points become very, very important. And I, I run a convenience store business by the name of 24 seven. And that is all about safety, people who come in, social distancing, uh, your employees wearing gloves, face masks, uh, face shields. So those are things that will start changing the way we look at the new normal. So what, uh, Kieran, what about you? So your uh, licensing partners, uh, and if you have uh, some uh, retail in particular you're working with for your uh, product, licensed products, I mean, uh, how do you plan to support them for their future new normal world? Yeah, I mean, it's again, it's 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 very different market to market. If I, you know, if if I compare the uh, the U.S., then there hasn't really been a slowdown. In fact, you know, for example, we license mini fridges in the U.S., and that business has nearly doubled 
in the last two months. We also license a lot of other homewares. Our business has also grown for two reasons. The demand has increased and the, the, the go-to-market is there because people are able to go and buy it. And that's both online and offline. Uh, if you look at, you know, Walmart, Walmart announced last week that their business had grown 10%. Lowe's business. So, so in the U.S., it isn't actually a, there isn't a support. I think, you know, uh, you know as Sammy just mentioned, we, we, of course, need to consider what is now the new experience. And for us, we, we think the consumer experience is primary. It's primary on their journey before they choose your brand and then the product. And it's primary when they own it. And it's primary when they're thinking about changing it or renewing it or repairing it. And so for us, when we think about that experience, of course, it's going to be different now in store. And we can't separate the online and offline. Uh, we can't think this is what, this is what uh, we focus on. Frida. We focus on the consumer. And by focusing on the consumer, we think about their whole journey. And therefore, the experience in retail has to blend with the experience online. Now, the difference is to, to some extent, we have uh, some control over the online experience where it's our own, for example, our own websites, et cetera. And we have a bit less control where it might be with a partner like Amazon or, or, or other online partners. But the whole kind of understanding from consumers about the experience and the, and the, the feedback and the reviews from them is what's kind of driving uh, you know, our plans. Now, the extent to which retailers have, you know, as Mark mentioned, maybe they have lines outside the door and they're restricting the number that can come in and maybe there's restrictions on, on products that can be touched or handled, et cetera. Um, that's something that's a bit outside our control, right? Something we need to understand, but it's not something that we can directly affect. So we need to be thinking about, in terms of the consumer, how can we account for that in terms of our relationship with the consumer? And that might be by giving them maybe a richer online experience. I already keep coming back to it, but for us, it's seamless. The two have to work together. In Europe, let's see what's going to happen because as, as retailers open, I think some of those retailers are going to go to the wall. I think there's going to be more consolidation. I think if we look at buying trends, then uh, in our research, then certainly the consumer electronics business is going to be hit a little bit. It looks like it looks like there's going to be less demand for uh, for consumer electronics than there was in the past. So we need, we'll need to look by retailer, by category, by brand, by territory, uh, and try and be focused. Because again, if we're trying to focus on the consumer, then we have to look at the consumer in, in life, in, in their journey, in that market. And there's no way that we can have, even if we have brands that are global, there is no one size fits all. And it has to be seamless. But different retailers are probably going to approach this in different ways. And we need to understand that as well. And then we need to understand the buying experience. Because for us, we do have products like mini fridges that are very close to our core products under license. But we also license solar, solar energy. Now, sustainability is something that, not to switch subjects, Christina, but sustainability now is clearly much more on people's minds than it was before. Not just in sustainable eating, but sustainable living. Uh, and, and we need to, to, to be close to that. Now, we don't sell solar through retail. You know, that's, that's a very different buying experience. Um, and I could go on and on about the different licensed products and categories we have, but there is no one size fits all. But if you start with the consumer and how they buy, how they purchase, and how they're moving to this equation of, you know, price, quality equals the value for it, how they're shifting, because there's no one metric. It's not just quality, not just price. And if we look at the fashion industry, luxury, luxury, true luxury is rarely licensed, luxury products, and rarely is affected in downturns. If you look at the 2008, 2009 downturn, the luxury market still goes on. Still, people still buy at the very high end, but that's rarely licensed. But if we're looking at you know, the, the, the other products you know, in the fashion industry, watches, eyewear, fragrance, of course that's affected, but the true high end isn't. So looking at the shift towards those brands, because I don't recommend that a brand suddenly drops its prices. You kill yeah, the brand. The brand, brand is positioned where brands, uh, yeah. But how do they make themselves more accessible? How do they make that value more evident to consumers in difficult times? How do they shift? How do they also extend through licensing into other product areas that the fashion industry has done for years? They bring people into the brands through fragrance eyewear and watches, not through selling couture 
lines. So I think that, that, that flexibility, that modeling, understanding the brand, the retail environment, the journey around the consumer in each market is what's going to be key. And that requires a lot of flexibility, a lot of agility, uh, and a lot of um, data and analytics to understand what's happening in real time. Yeah, I will say that now you have, uh, you have said a, a crucial point that is also about, uh, yeah, I totally agree with you. So how everything is different based on categories and the kind of products and of course, uh, uh, also the different kind of retailers. And I would say that among all the different types of retailers, fashion retailers will be uh, the most affected by this crisis because uh, uh, what, first of all, fashion won't be the first thing that the consu consumers will have in mind as soon as will they go out because uh, many people will keep on working on smart working. Uh, many others uh, don't consider to go to holidays pretty soon uh, and uh, you know how much tourism uh, also involves uh, so many different kind of business including fashion as well so if you consider the spring summer collection for example no uh, so uh, yes fashion would say that is uh, one of the most critical categories and including the retailers, the retailers as well in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in this period. And I think also about Roberto, no? Marie Claire is a, a lifestyle brand and uh, as you say before, is developed through fashion. So what about you, how you are supporting your retail and licenses uh, partners in this period when uh, fashion is not considered so important? Work. Yes, of, of, of course, you're, you're, you're right saying that uh, fashion is heavily uh, affected, uh, except, uh, except uh, high-end, of course, 100% under, under with you. We are in affordable uh, luxury, small prices, uh, almost for uh, not in a fast fashion uh, ritual, but uh, to give customer the possibility to enjoy uh, shopping. So this is where uh, Marie Claire is. Of course, uh, fashion uh, has been affected uh, in India, I would say more through logistic lockdown than a specific need. But where the brand comes is once again in bringing a positive contribution. I'm insisting on this word, it's exactly what I have in mind, is uh, the motivation and uh, let me tell you, somehow also uh, the generosity. So brand can communicate on uh, generosity. Brand can communicate more about uh, to bring a positive contribution. So this is, uh, this is my vision, this is uh, my commitment. And of course, uh, through Marie Claire as a content generator, I think uh, we have a lot to do in adding uh, to product and services uh, this direction of uh, messages. This is my, my, my vision. Of course, uh, once again, in India, we are young and uh, the business model in fashion, fashion accessories is 100% online, which uh, we wanted to. But of course, uh, once again, to, to connect with, uh, with customers, I, I want to bring a project, uh, uh, you know, what is called, generally speaking, temporary stores. You know what uh, I mean? Uh, we have been uh, saturated about pop-up and temporary stores in the last few years. Where I see the innovation in uh, temporary stores is uh, once again uh, to catch uh, the elements for the innovation, to catch the element for new uh, shopping concept experiences. So I think uh, what uh, the brand should do together in partner with licensee is just to activate on uh, on a workshop, on a temporary store, on special project, just to connect and reconnect physically, once again, physically with the community and society. Yeah, so I agree with you. We, we, sooner or later, we have to go back to the physical approach, hopefully. No, it's, it's, it's a specific 
is a specific time to reconnect with physical approach. It's so specific. We are so suffering of having been confined with the protection, with the gel, masks, and gloves, that of course we are very much sensitive to it. Yeah. And uh, once again, uh, uh, temporary areas, workshops, will bring, uh, will bring us to a next generation of the physical spaces somehow. You know, uh, I, I just signed a project before the, the, the COVID. We have signed in India for hospitality to open, uh, to open boutique hotel branded Marie Claire Paris uh, for India, uh, Sri Lanka, Mauritius. So basically uh, the nice destination for Indian couples or Indian families to go for a weekend, to go for holidays. And uh, of course, this project will be postponed for at least six up to 12 months, of course. But uh, once again, thinking about lounge rooms, restaurant spaces as a next generation spaces, this is a mission for a brand today. So it's a great opportunity to reconnect with the community, but uh, you know, we, need, we need to experience this. Yeah, and pass through a certain period, this period. So, <laughs> Mark, uh, um, what about you? So, your uh, marketing approach to, to retail and uh, how you are supporting your licensees, uh, partners, and uh, how you plan to support them uh, for what will be the future? Yeah, sure. I mean, each partner we have obviously I mean I have over 31 brands in my portfolio so there's no one size um, fits all but certainly we looking we're looking across the landscape globally um, and to Kieran's point really trying to help where we can with retailers that are back in market um, so in terms of in-store online um, utilizing our own and marketing channels of course where appropriate and also to, to, to someone else's point they made earlier about looking at other channels, other retailers that we may or may not have worked with in the past, um, we're now looking at in more detail to try and work out how we can work with them, if at all. Um, I think, you know, it is a new world um, and there's no such thing as a bad idea. And certainly for licensees particularly, you know, these are people that have signed up contractually to, to substantial um, revenue. Um, so we have to help them to, to achieve what we've set out, uh, you know, as their vision and goal looking at, as I say, looking at their retail channels, their wholesalers, distribution, um, certainly markets where maybe there, there weren't such significant opportunities. We're now looking at them in more detail. Um, we have to expand our global footprint. There's no doubt about it. Um, as, a, as an American business, we're heavily re reliant on the American um, side of our, of our business unit, but we need that's changing and has been in fairness before COVID, um, certainly because of the, the the other thing that's coming down the track that's going to affect us as well is obviously the trade war between China and America. Um, so there are multiple things that are going to come down as a result of COVID that we need to be aware of as well. And it's all about, as I said before, it's about multiple touch points, helping where you can in-house, externally, talking to our contacts, talking to our, our suppliers, our wholesalers, our retailers, um, and making sure they're aware that we're there. And I think the other thing that's going to come down the track in terms of fashion retail is stock. There's going to be an issue with stock. Um, a lot of people cancelled orders immediately when COVID hit. Um, so yes, the market's going to open and yes, there'll be stock in market. But there's going to be a point where potentially you're going to have retailers where they won't have anything to sell. So th there's other challenges that are coming down the track. So yes, right here, right now, it's about staying in contact and trying to get stores open. But ultimately, we've got to look way beyond that. I mean, we work 18 months ahead of the market, as I'm sure most of us do. So we're having to try and second guess what's going on. It's like, okay, well, if, for example, you know, if, I don't know, if one of the Debenhams or some, some one of the, those guys goes under, how are we going to place that revenue? Okay, well, where's, who else can we work with? So we have to be really nimble on our feet, constant communication with our licensees, constant communication um, globally, and trying to help them where they can. If they've got a contact in Turkey and we don't sell in Turkey and Turkey's all of a sudden an opportunity, Let's look at it. Let's fast track that. Um, I think now is not the time to be precious. Now is the time to be open um, and to really, you know, and work collaboratively with, with all of your partners. 
but according to you, Mark, it will happen that, uh, you know, many, many big uh, fashion brands, I would say the first is Armani, who made um, an article, a very interesting article during lockdown period and said that we should jump entirely the spring summer collection 2020 and uh, uh, go and don't produce a future 2021 collection, but uh, go ahead on retail with the 2020 as it was totally over. I mean, as nobody could buy it. So uh, go slower with the fashion, produce less uh, and uh, um, change. So the approach, the fashion approach and uh, um, get a deeper, a deeper experience with the customer not going so fast as the fashion was used to be so fast. Yeah. So I, I will ask to uh, the organizer, how does it work with the question and answer? Because we do have some questions. Okay, okay that's me. Yeah, I will take it over. Thank you all for the wonderful uh, session and sharing your valuable thoughts. We'll move on to the question and answer sessions. Can I have the audio for Mr. Naresh? Mr. Naresh Ahunja. I'll ask his question. Uh, his question is that he... They hello, are hello. Here. Okay, hello. He's there. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Mr. Naresh, you can ask your question now. Yeah, yeah. One minute, one minute, one minute. Uh, can, I, can I ask after one minute? Just give me one minute. Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. Take the other question meanwhile. No problem, no problem. Can we have the audio for Mr. Vijay? Hello. Yeah, Vijay, sir, you can ask your question now. Yeah, like I have a question, like, you know, that like, as you, as I mentioned there that, you know, we are in the fashion industries and we carry two big brands, uh, Cross and Police. Uh, so how, because we are the biggest manufacturers, so how we can grow more, uh, you know, because you're selling that, you know, because in the whole seminar, you will focusing more upon the digital marketing. Uh, as you know, that we are the manufacturers so our currently we are not uh, having much focus on internet uh, on this uh, digital uh, digital marketing so how we can grow it more you know through offline and secondly you know we are planning to have more brands into our basket so which brand will be good because we are into the leather industries so which brand will be good for us to go go with more Hello. Hi, who, who's the question for? I like it was a journey for uh, everyone. Yeah, so we could uh, start with the same tour. So Samir, first you, if you want to answer to this question. The microphone, Samir, the microphone, the mi your microphone. Uh, my question to Vijay would be, or the answer to Vijay would be yeah. that since you're manufacturers of, uh, of footwear, uh, the only way to do it is tie up with people who are online, uh, multi-brand stores who are online. That, that is the best mechanism uh, to actually, reach out. Actually, we are not footwear. We are into sorry. leather industries. Leather industry. Sorry, my apologies. Uh, it's, what, what do you make in leather industry? Uh, like SLGs. Okay. Uh, like bags, wallets. So, uh, do, you, do you do private label or do you do private, uh, label. private label as well? And we do, we have the license for cross and police as well, both. So the, I think the, the best way would be to get into multi-brand stores, uh, online multi-brand stores would be the best option for you to market your, your product and license product that you have. Okay. So basically means you're saying that, you know, you, we should partnership with the uh, Amazons or, you know, in India, like Tripcards with these companies. Yeah, the likes of those. Yes, not Amazon, but but companies that are fully focused on the leather leather goods and and multi branded uh, items. Like you probably can get into Mintra, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. effects like that. Okay. <clears throat> and um, 
so like you were saying through online we just have to partnership there through that we can grow apart from this there is any other channel like you know uh, to grow globally because we are not only focusing on uh, you know in india market domestic but we are to our uh, internationally because we carry the international brands i think one of the things you need to look at is you is working with a brand that has its own stores um if you've got you said you've got police is that correct I'll take that as a yes. Um, <laughs> so, if you if you can work with a retailer that has own stores, with a licensee that has own stores, that would give you an, another opportunity as well. But Sammy's right. At the moment, um, you'll have to be looking at online. But don't forget, realistically, you're not going to be in market now till autumn, winter next year. Um, so a lot will change. A lot will change in that time. So yes, focus on online for now. But realistically, if you sign a license, say with me tomorrow. You wouldn't. I would. We'd be looking at autumn winter twenty one. Um, so we'd be looking at our stores and how we'd support you in in, in our stores and our books and more. Uh, and we'd be looking for you in terms of distribution to focus online. But what we wouldn't want is for you to start out in the value market. Um, and I think you know, going back to one of the points Kieran made earlier, um, is that yes, value and price is going to be extremely important. But it's about holding the line. It's about holding your brand value. Um, someone earlier made the point about luxury brands don't don't they really they fail to suffer in significant downturns um and a lot of brands are going to be looking at that and wondering how do they go up how do they shift up so you're going to see collaborations in the market so if you've got a license with police and i've got a, and i've got a, and i've got a, my penguin license for example well maybe there's a collaboration there where police and penguin benefit at the same time so it's about being clever it's about cross-pollination across markets yes it's online of course, but you, at my point, you're working 12 months out. So don't get hung up on online at this stage. Bricks and more will come back, but it will be different. Okay, can we have uh, the audio for Mr. Naresh, please? Mr. Naresh, you can unmute your, uh, and you can ask your question and answer. Yes, hello everybody. Nice to meet you all. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Mr. Hello. Yeah. Hello, Mr. Nareesh, we can hear you. Yeah. I want to know that uh, in these uh, difficult times of uh, COVID, uh, how are uh, you helping your licensees to market their, are you helping them to market the products? This is, uh, are you giving some support to them? Well, this is part one. Second is that how do you guarantee the quality of the product is in tune with your brand the values and your your standards uh, do you have some uh, you know uh, system where you uh, you know keep checks and you control the uh, product quality and the packaging and uh, do you help those brands to you know the give those type of packaging uh, options which and the designs do you help them in all these things or only the brand name is uh, uh, given to the parties I, I can I can say something yeah. if you if you're okay. About social guidance and so on. So Roberto, go ahead, please. Yes. Uh, just uh, just uh, to just to share that uh, licensing is uh, is uh, is a fantastic opportunity to work together, licensor and licensee. They just they are not just limited to sell IP, but of course there is a fantastic journey to do together and. Uh, in terms of product, in terms of quality, and in terms of ethic, there are many elements which uh, which are resume in uh, in a typical uh, in a typical um, uh, draft of uh, process of uh, approval and validation from the beginning, from the input until the output, including distribution, including uh, management of stocks, and so on. So it's very well detailed. So. Is a full accompaniment with uh, with a good experience that the licensor normally bring uh, on the table when he meets a licensee. Uh, first of all, second of all, how to how to assist the licensees uh, during uh, this uh, pandemic time? Of course, is really short. Um, to give you my personal uh, case, is really short to to see the reaction. But of course, is uh, 
behind uh, the, the, the critic time is of course dedicated to the future, is of course understanding where are the difficult now. Uh, for instance, to make a real example, we are in a beauty salon in, as, a, as an opportunity of licensing Marie Claire, a successful, successful opportunity, but of course beauty salon have been badly affected by you know, two months of uh, lockdown. A few of them are obliged to shut down just because they couldn't match uh, the request of the landlord in terms of, uh, you know, someone before said the retail is uh, just a real estate operation, which somehow is right. If you don't have flexibility today in real estate, you're, you die. So some of our new franchisee, because we have a, we have a license, we have licensed the, the, the category through a possibility of franchising locally, so some of our new franchisees, they are obliged to shut down just because uh, real estate conditions were very, very strict and rigid during this time. How to protect? Well, it's difficult to say. It's case by case and it's area by area. Uh, it's, difficult, it's difficult, but of course, uh, the, the concentration is there. Okay. Hello, Christina, I, I can add very, very briefly, just to this very, very briefly, that we're actually buying products from our licensees and selling through our own online channels to putting it along our other accessory products and other products, number one. And then the other a question on quality, uh, we do have a whole in-house quality team. So across Electrolux, we actually have 100 quality auditors. Uh, and uh, three of those auditors actually are dedicated just to licensing. So the expectation is that a, a licensing partner can design, manufacture, and distribute. Uh, but we do more than just provide the guidelines. We, uh, we also follow up at all stages of production from authorizing manufacturers right through to checking at retail. Uh, because, you know, as was mentioned just now by Roberto, it's much more than just IP. It's about the consumer and they must have a seamless experience between core products and licensed products. I would agree. I mean, I, I follow the, exactly what Karen just said. That's exactly what we have. We have separate teams in place. Um, is exactly the same. And we're also buying product from licensees who are online. Yeah, licensing is uh, something much more complex than just an AP. So if you want, we can make then some more uh, uh, training workshop on how to use brands for uh, products. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody, thank you. for joining this wonderful session. Christina, thank you so much for being the moderator. Uh, all the rest of the questions you can answer offline. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, everybody. It was lovely being together. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Christina. Thank you to the organizer. uh, organizers. It's been a lovely session. Yeah, thank thanks you. so much. Super job, Christina, and super job, uh, Bradford License India. Great Thank summit. You, Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you guys. for inviting me. Please, Mark. Thanks, guys. Love Thank to meet you. you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Stay safe, huh? Thanks to the audience and to the wonderful speakers. Thanks to all of you and I'll see you soon. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. <clears throat> okay, so let's move on to the third panel discussion for the day. This session will discuss on navigating the new normal, how licensees and business partners need to be changing their game, that's Asia Focus. This session will be for around 45 minutes, followed by Q&A for 15 minutes. The speakers for the sessions are Mr. Pralhat Krishnamurthy, Head of Flipkart Fashion Originals and Licenses, Private Labels and Senior Director. Michelle Minieri, President Bradford Licensing, LLC USA. Alan, President and COO, LMCA. B ben Peace, Senior Licensing Director, SEA and India, Hasbro. The session moderator would be Sachin Maria, President and CEO, Franchise India Group. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Tisha, for uh, connecting us. Uh, uh, welcome, uh, dear panelists. Uh, uh, we've got uh, Michelle and Alan joining from US. Uh, so good morning, 
and uh, Ben and Prahlad, when uh, Ben is in Singapore and Prahlad is in Bangalore. So good evening to both of you and thank you Ben for sending the day. Um, so uh, we've, we've, like uh, our uh, panelists, we've got a global audience and I, I wish all of them uh, a safe, uh, safe lockdown or if you're not in lockdown and opening up uh, a, sooner, uh, a sooner recovery for your businesses. Uh, this is the first uh, virtual conference that we are uh, attempting uh, along with Bradford. And uh, the idea was to sort of look at what is the new, new normal for licensing. Uh, and uh, I've got a great panel here. Uh, before I jump on to sort of sharing some questions to them, I've got certain points that are around which I would, I would sort of keep the discussion moving. Uh, one of the key, uh, uh, the topic that we are looking at is how licensing, uh, licensees and business partners are getting affected at this time. And uh, what is the change management that we are looking at uh, with, with help by helping licensees and licensors sort of connect. And, uh, uh, you know, the life is very different on both sides of the, of, the, uh, of the equation because on one side, you've got these brand owners who, who look at opportunity uh, uh, side and a lot of licensees are these small businesses, SMEs who are at this point in time struggling. And, and licensing globally works very efficiently with with role of an agent uh, so I've got a great panel. I've got two agency leaders with me. I've got uh, a brand owner uh, from Southeast Asia, Ben, and we've got Prahlad, who's, who's directly um, leading uh, one of the largest e-commerce platforms, so um, Flipkart. So, so we're going to take perspective from all sides. So uh, one of the key things that we're going to speak about is uh, India opportunity and the China situation, which is, which is happening, being Asia-focused panel. Uh, these are two large markets and how a uh, change in one market could probably help another and what are the measures to be taken. Uh, there's an emergence of digital and new retail which is happening and I'm going to seek uh, panel's advice on how they are seeing in their businesses, new revenue opportunities, new categories. Uh, we are seeing sanitizers, masks. Uh, there's a new due to see opportunity which is emerging in India which I'm, I'm going to take Prahlad on. And then we've got an emergence of uh, food and beverage and personal care, which some of the panelists spoke about. I'm gonna sort of seek uh, some of the panelists here uh, to sort of uh, give us, throw some light on those categories. I know Ellen does a lot of work there. And uh, most importantly at this time, it's all about relationships between licensors and licenses and how we're going about it and how creatively we are seeking, uh, uh, seeking interest from um, 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 how creatively we are solving these problems and seeking interest from the market. So I'm going to come to Prahlad, you first and sort of uh, seek your thoughts on how lockdown has kind of put, uh, put focus and fraction happens to be the largest segment in India, how you're, how you're dealing with it. Yeah. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Sajin. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, I think, uh, where can I start? I think, um, Largely, uh, I think Flipkart and Mintra have opened operations as on earlier, as early as this week, uh, for non-essentials. Non Essentials have been something which has been going on for the last uh, couple of months, and uh, the trend which we largely see is that uh, there is an uptake uh, or a bent up demand which has been there in the market, and people are coming back to shop for essentials. In fact, uh, non-essentials. In fact one of the uh, biggest categories which is coming back um, and it's come back to quite a bit of a glory is kids clothing or baby care uh, so as to speak that uh, 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 surprised us quite a bit uh, but uh, it was not unexpected uh, uh, to put in words but uh, i see fashion taking at least another couple months to try and get back but with respect to categories like home categories like electronics as well all this is almost back uh, to levels which are pre-COVID, which is quite good. Uh, uh, but here, uh, what we'll have to see is that uh, the number of sellers who are getting activated on our platform across the country is also slowly increasing because as and when the sellers are coming out of the lockdown zones, they are able to slowly resume operations. As and when they're resuming operations, uh, the economy or uh, 
uh, will improve with respect to the number of people trying to sell their products and customers supply and demand can be met and i'm hoping that maybe in the next 45 to 60 days things will be at least back to 70 80% normalcy so that's where i currently see but over the year amongst priority fashion is something which i feel will shrink a little bit uh, and there will be a more, more of focus on essentials and uh, i think that trend is going to continue even in fashion i'm talking primarily about fashion essentials yeah yeah back to you sachin and on a long term, do you think there's going to be a shift towards e-commerce and uh, you know emergence in in private label as a category? I still feel that the coexistence of offline and online is going to continue. I don't see any dramatic shift uh, which is going to happen because the needs of these customers are very different, right? I see the kind of equilibrium or the state which has been there for the last uh, few months to come back. Um, so I don't see a major shift with respect to the online space increasing dramatically. I don't see that happening. At least that's not as for initial trends. So I see us going back largely to a January kind of a scenario, maybe hopefully by August. Yeah. Because there, there was there was some news that I was referring to, and I can check the Dalton and Michelle, uh, wherein uh, the, there's a surge in US on on digital, and first time the digital has. Uh, uh, done better than the physical retail in in america so so there's a there's a forced change which we are seeing right now so are you seeing some trends there yeah so there is uh, so with respect to immediate need obviously there could be some kind of an increase in certain categories because not everything is available in your neighborhoods these days right i mean quite a few categories are unavailable they are traditional shops where you would have bought stuff uh, is either closed or not yet open so that could lead to a potential shift, but I don't see this impacting us in the long term or impacting the equilibrium too much in the long term uh, with respect to online gaining uh, too much, but it is there to support. I mean, more and more how I see it is that many traditional, uh, let us say, uh, companies which sell or smaller entrepreneurs which sell on Flipkart as well, rather than focusing a little more on their uh, offline distribution, currently could focus more on online still that picks up. Because people are still KG to go out of their homes, and especially in India, I think lockdown has been taken quite seriously. Yeah, but over the last week, I think things are opening up a little bit. I was, I was speaking to one of the bridge to luxury brands, and he, for him, e-commerce was never a priority. He was ninety percent, and he said that I see that moving to maybe thirty percent e-commerce. Uh, that was a that was a big shift from from what I saw. His approach was. And, um, you know, so, so stuff like that when it starts happening and there's a kind of shift in terms of market share as well. So we were doing a conference on e-commerce uh, recently and we realized that uh, some of the folks were saying that, you know, there's going to be a 20 to 50 percent market share shift, uh, which could be seen just by O2O kind of a strategy shift. Somebody would be able to adapt. Somebody would not be able to adapt. Any thoughts on that one? Uh, uh, what is interesting which you brought about is O2O, right? Uh, so, uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm talking about coexistence. So omni-channel as a concept is very, very nascent and not yet evolved in the country, right? I see that taking up uh, quite a bit of mind space. I think that's the way to solve it because beyond a point, online cannot solve for touch and feel, especially in fashion, right? Tried and tested brands, maybe you have a particular kind of a habit you could largely go back to it but i see this resurgence of omni channel quite a bit in fact over the last couple of weeks as and when offline stores have opened up the kind of i mean i've seen one uh, a couple of videos on uh, target and dj max opening abroad as well but the kind of let us say footfalls which these stores are exper uh, experiencing is quite positive so i think uh, this kind of a dramatic shift which you're talking about i think is a little maybe could be potentially overstated as per me Shift is possible, but yeah, I don't think the shift is going to be that dramatic. Very interesting. So I'm going to come to Ben now, and uh, Ben, you want to add something? What your uh, from from Southeast Asia perspective, any change that you're seeing, and how's how's e-commerce uh, doing for your business? And you may want to sort of share with the uh, audience a bit about your business as well. Sure. Well, again, uh, real pleasure to be here. So thank you, uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I think, you know, in contrast to what Pralab said, in Southeast Asia, I, I, I do see um, a, a shift on, on the e-com piece. 
just sort of taking a step back, just for perspective for all of the people tuned in, uh, for, the, for those that are kind of aren't familiar with what's going on in Southeast Asia, predominantly across the Southeast Asian region, everywhere has been in full lockdown, only really allowed to leave um, where you live for either essential groceries or, or exercise. And it's only now in, in the last few days and, 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 and week that, that that's started to change. So in Thailand, in Malaysia, it started to open up slightly. Um, but we, we're sort of seeing that as a relatively slow process. And, and in terms of consumer demand coming back, it's, um, you know, we're not seeing dramatic spikes. Um, I think when it comes to e-commerce, Southeast Asia under trade versus the rest of the world. Um, and so there's, there's, there's a, a significant amount of headroom for lots of different reasons. Um, and, you know, time will tell how it, how it plays out. But I would say that it was a, a trend we were seeing anyway, the move, move to e-commerce. Um, and the, this is going to accelerate that. I think consumers are being forced to, um, to buy things online when they didn't previously. And so they're, they're having that experience for the first time and, and a lot of them will have a great experience and, and the, the price, the convenience um, will mean that they want to uh, either stay exclusively in that channel or more likely they'll, they'll just have that within their shopping repertoire. Um, I think the, the other impactor is that our, our licensing partners, um, our licensees, uh, are being forced to, to really up their game on, on e-commerce. And, and, and so through this period where e-commerce has been a more significant opportunity and as, 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 um, as markets open up a little bit more, it, it will remain so, um, getting a great selection of product online, upping their game in terms of product pages and SEO, um, that's something we're, you know, I'm, I'm talking to uh, um, my agency partners and licensees about all the time. And so I think those two things, I think the change in consumer behavior and I think the change in the offer um, from both retail and, and from licensees is going to mean that, you know, I don't, I don't know how, how, how much it will accelerate that, that, that trend, but I think that it will have a, um, an accelerative impact, yeah. Sure. Uh, so when, when we speak about opening up, Alan, I'm going to come to you and sort of if you could share some, uh, some insight from China, what's, what's, what, how you're seeing opening up uh, trends in China. Thank you. Yes, we have um, our Asia headquarters in Shanghai. And I would tell you that at this point, despite all of the closures and lockdowns, the rest of the world and through the United States, particularly in New York, where our headquarters is located, we're taking a lot of encouragement from China in that our people have been behind their desks for six plus weeks right now. And it's, it's largely business as usual in a lot of ways. In fact, this morning I received an invitation to a public party that's being hosted in, in just a few weeks. And that's the first invitation I've gotten to anything that isn't through Zoom in two plus months now. And so we, we've seen the lockdown and we've seen people working remotely in China, but now the manufacturing sites are largely up and running and companies are having their orders filled. And the concern really in China is going forward, how is the world going to regard them? And how are people going to look at China relative to its former place as supply as a supply source? And we think that's one of the key issues going forward in terms of one, how governments are going to look at China, and two, how individual companies are going to look at China, and what they're going to do about their sourcing going forward. I think the opportunities for other countries in Asia and India and Mexico and producing companies like that has, has not looked better in recent times. It's going to be very, very interesting to see how that plays out. And uh, what, what kind of measures do you think India could take at this time to sort of tap on the opportunity which uh, all of us are seeing? Because it's one is an opportunity, one is to sort of how you act on those opportunities to make it favorable for companies to sort of, uh, de you know, move their manufacturing bases in India and how it's going to impact also from a, from a licensing standpoint. Well, the first thing that it's doing from a licensing point of view is it, it's making people much more interested, not only in what the, about the licensee and, and who they are and what their financial resources are and do they supply quality products 
and provide a great customer experience, all those usual things. But now people are looking much more closely at their sourcing. Where are they getting products from? And, and how might that impact their ability to be a great licensee going forward? We've seen that start sometime even before COVID because of some of the stances that the US government has taken relative to China and some uh, trade and tariff issues. That's become intensified now. And we're not really not sure how that's going to play out in the future, except that there's a great sensitivity there. And I think that's an opportunity. And, and most countries, I think, are going to look a little bit more inwardly than they have in the past, which means that domestic manufacturing in India is probably going to get a bump. I think Indian brands are going to get a bump. And, and there'll be other opportunities to better the, the place in the, in the world order by being a supplier to a broader range of, of uh, companies. Sure. Uh, uh, Michelle, I'm going to get you here. Uh, and if you could speak about how you, you manage great brands like Pepsi and um, other, other brands that you were speaking about from, a, uh, from an Asian point of view, if you have some experiences and some thoughts around it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, as uh, Alan was saying, that uh, a lot of consumers now are going to be much more sensitive to um, sourcing. So I think that has a lot of impact in our businesses. And um, for example, uh, Pepsi has a pretty robust licensing program throughout Asia. Um, and they've been consistency, consistently building that over the years. Um, recently, we've seen a lot of pushback in that area um, because of the sourcing issues. And I think, uh, again, as Alan said, even before the COVID hit, um, it was something that consumers were looking at um, more specifically when selecting items. But in those areas, um, the programs have worked really well. And um, I think now what we're seeing is um, trying to bridge the gap between the licensee and the licensor and come to a mutually agreeable uh, middle ground where we could go out together and get reach the consumer in a positive way. So, you know, whereas licensees are pushing for um, longer lead terms, they want um, extra years, they want um, guarantees pushed back to the end of their contracts. Um, brand owners on the other end are saying, well, you know, we, we need that revenue coming in to support our brand and we need things on a timely manner. So I think just coming up with creative ways that we can set up these contracts to satisfy both parties is, is what we've been working on with both entities. Uh, we've been able to come up with uh, new ways to set up, you know, uh, tiered royalty rates, um, or um, guarantees that, you know, perhaps start out lower, but reach to what the brand owner needs and in, in order to set their contracts and their licensing budgets. Um, so I think just overall, it's flexibility. Um, we've been very flexible with our programs and um, kind of educating the brand owners to make sure that they understand that. And in order to build their brand positively, that that's what we have to do in these areas. And um, it, it's been working well. Um, and I think the, especially the longer term licensees that we have on board are appreciative of that. And the newer licensees that come on are able to get started. Whereas, you know, they were shut out before because they weren't able to meet those business term criteria. Um, so, yeah, I think just flexibility in general has been the key with most of our partners. So I'm going to come to the opportunities, and I'm sure there are opportunities both from, from negotiation possibilities and new, new, new categories and markets, and I'm going to take uh, our cue on that. So I'm going to come to Ben, and, uh, you know, so when, when you talk about this expectation settings and relationships, so you want to talk about how you're managing change management for your licensees, how, how this relationship is further being managed from your side, Ben? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I would say kind of from, from the off, we're, we don't know kind of how this is going to, uh, to end and, and, and play out. And I think, you know, building on what Michelle said, we're, we're really in this together with our licensees, you know, their success 
is, is ours. And so, um, you know, Hasbro, like many of our peers, I'm sure, you know, we, we will remain flexible, um, you know, whether that's about, you know, the, the commercial terms we have or, you know, just, just, just being at our licensee side to, to work out what the future holds. I think, you know, we, we, we're spending a lot of time at the moment with our agents and licensees, um, just gathering information and, and working out exactly what, what is happening in each of our territories. Uh, in each of our categories and channels and, and, and sharing that information, sharing best practice. And there the will be for our, um, for our licensing partners, there's, there's all sorts of opportunities. You know, the, 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 the period that we're in is incredibly challenging, incredibly disruptive, um, but it's also gonna, gonna create this new environment in which there's an absolute ton of opportunity. And some of that is, is short term. It's in this kind of crisis period that we've, we're kind of coming through. And some of it will be will be more enduring. And, and I think at this point, you know, we've got some guesses as to where that might go, but we don't. No one really knows. And so we're 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 just constantly in, in communication with our partners and looking at whether it's channel, um, you know, category, consumer, all all of those lenses that we look through uh, to, to to see how we need to be flexible in the short term to support our partners, and then how we can you know innovate and and look to the future for for those opportunities. So uh, managing relationships and managing change for your licensees is one of the key things. So, Vlad, I'm going to get you and Alan also to sort of speak about it. So, if you can go first, Vlad. Yeah, uh, I'm on the other side, right? So, we are the licensee. And largely, I think the partners have been appreciative of, of these times. And uh, it's about having the right conversation with each and every partner. So, we uh, handle at least at any point in time, I think, around 11 or 12 partners across the world, right? And... Uh, so uh, the realization which is there with a few companies is a little more revolved. I will be honest there with respect to how they uh, see any partnerships. As I think Michelle mentioned, all the long-term relationships are largely continue to remain strategic in nature. So there are different types of structuring which we are doing potentially uh, in the short term. Like uh, uh, with respect to, like she mentioned, tiered royalty rates, like right? as she mentioned, let's say uh, a potential increase in marketing spend, which could be plowed back from a royalty part by the principal back into the brand to try and you know, uh, uh, get ahead of uh, competition. So it's also, uh, I also see it as an opportunity with respect to if the, as and when the lockdown is opening. So for that limited, uh, exp uh, what do you call disposable income, which is available in the country today, right? So multiple brands are gonna try for that space. So the one who is, thinking a little long-term and is able to invest in this time to build the right messaging and uh, able to connect their brand with the cause, with, let us say, what they stand for and whatnot. I think that'll go, that'll go the longer way. And there are a few partners who are cognizant of it. And I think uh, uh, the ones who are on top of this curve or appreciate the fact that there are better times ahead in 21, 22, 23, I think uh, the, uh, those are the ones who will get ahead uh, quite easily, right? But the reality is there are many principals as well who are struggling. There are many brands as well who are struggling. I mean, we have gone over the last couple of months, the number of companies which have filed for bankruptcy is shocking. And uh, that way, the licensee or the platform also has to be cognizant of the financial strength. If the brand doesn't exist next year, then there is no point uh, with respect to us trying to build that. So it depends on each partner. Potentially, if a partner is struggling, then you need to come to that middle ground. So it's a case by case evaluation, which has to happen. It's unfortunately not a one size fit all approach at all. It's good to hear that you know, people are receptive of it. Alan, you wanna uh, share some thoughts. You manage quite a few relationships uh, uh, for your brands and how you're managing uh, licensor and licensee relationships there. Sure, There's an, an interesting thing has come out of this. We've seen some fascinating research there's the old research that says that 66 days is about the time that it takes for people to build a new habit. They've had more time than that. And we've seen people getting used to the new habit of shopping online and being much more concerned with their home and their immediate surroundings, which are driving a lot of trends. We've seen other research that says that fully 75% using digital channels for the first time are gonna to continue to use them. 
for us, one of the things that that builds is a broader view for how we need to help our licensees to be successful. Before we looked at channels and we wanted to make certain that the licensees were taking advantage of, of the, the channels for distribution for their goods, whatever they were. It's becoming clear to us that the internet and, and web, of course, we, we knew earlier on, as a number of the panelists have said, that there's a large increase in the use of the web to shop. It's gotten bigger and bigger, and we don't think that's going away anytime soon. And, and it may, even when things return to normal, be a much bigger percentage than it was in the past because these habits are here. People have seen the convenience. It works for them and they're carrying on that way. So we're, we're much more concerned now going forward about finding licensees who really understand the web in a way that wasn't quite as important before and, and who are much broader and deeper in social media and the kinds of contacts that they can have and the kind of marketing they can do to help grow the licensor's brand than has been the case in the past. And to, to sort of echo Prahlad's comments in a different sphere, it's not just the brands that have to be well financed here and, and not disappear in tough times. It's also the licensees. And so you have to be all that much more careful that you're taking on people that can survive these kinds of economic shifts. Uh, hopefully this will be the last of them in our lifetime. And this hasn't happened in what, a hundred years since the early 1900s that things have just come to a stop, but there's no telling that that's necessarily the case. And, and so financial stability and resources and a long-term view are proving incredibly critical as we go forward. Sure. So uh, what, what's the new normal? I mean, this goes to all the, all the panelists here. What is the new normal? What are the new uh, ways to engage consumer? What are the new ways to add more value to license or licensee relationships? So, so if we can continue with you, Alan, and I'll come to other panelists post this. Well, we think that delivering on the brand's promise remains central that the consumer needs to see one seamless offering between the brand and its licensees and that that product and that marketing needs to be in exactly the same image across all distribution, across all products, across all markets. In the, in the old days, many, many years ago when I got into licensing initially, there were many brands that had an image in the US and an image in Europe. With the internet, that's impossible. I mean, people don't even think about that anymore, but everything has to be seamless. The consumer in China is seeing exactly the same thing that the consumer in, in uh, Chicago is seeing. And so they need to have the same image. It needs to have the same quality and it needs to really resonate in the same way with consumers. And so that's, that's a real challenge given the fashion sense and the utility and design and sometimes sizing in different uh, different markets, but that's really something that licensors have to maintain as they go forward in order to ensure that their brand are, remains exactly what they hope it will be and continues to grow. You're saying the, the it, uh, brands are now being looked at as global, single identity, seamless uh, uh, distribution in terms of communication. Uh, you know, Michelle, you want to add something, how you, how your brands are adding more value, how are they engaging more customers? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, first to, to point back to what uh, your original question was, I think, you know, how are things kind of changing and evolving? And um, one of the areas we, we have been promoting and seeing more and more of within the um, agency uh, relationship, I guess I would say, is, is building a bigger and more um, transparent community of the licensees. So we're having much more open um, communication and pulling them together more so that they can interact with each other and pull on the, each other's resources. So whereas maybe one of the licensees has a um, very strong e-commerce, uh, let's say is based in e-commerce like Flipkart, um, you know, have the other licensees perhaps um, distribute their products on his website. 
um, or vice versa. You know, maybe someone else has a really strong entryway into a big box retailer, use their um, contacts to get in together. So we've been trying to set up these summits with the licensees based on location and territory where they can interact with each other on a more, um, a more consistent manner and utilize each other's strengths to help build the program. Whereas in the past, maybe, um, you know, they were treated, I think, much more separate. Um, you know, each, each business was individualized for the licensees. So that's something um, that we're really pushing. And, uh, you know, I think the licensees have really engaged in it well and are, are looking towards that um, and kind of looking towards the licensor to help build that as well, help bridge that communication between the, all the partners within the program. Great. So, uh, Ben, how are, how are you going about engaging? What is the new normal according to you in licensing, which you're, which you're seeing coming out of the post COVID? Yeah. I, I mean, I'd, I'd go back to what I said before. I, I think we, we, we've not yet found, um, or settled into the, the new normals. So we, we, we're still in a very changed environment. And I, and I, I mean, I honestly think, you know, we, we, we were saying things like change is the only constant uh, well before COVID came along. You know, the, 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 we are living in a time where, you know, product cycles and, and the change in consumer taste and preferences is happening at a more and more rapid rate. Now, COVID's come along and it's, it's kind of changed everything. It's had such a colossal impact in so many different ways. But even once we get through this, other things will come along. They might not be quite so dramatic, um, but they will, they will still change the environment. And so I, I, I'm just a passionate believer that we just need to constantly, you know, reevaluate, are we fit for purpose as a licensor, as a licensee, as a retailer, um, and, and adapt to that um, I I environment. And, and I would say to, to Alan's point, I think they, you know, we are now, a, a global community, there is transparency across markets. And I think that point around brand consistency is, is incredibly important. But what I would also say is we, we, we really want every consumer to have the opportunity to engage with our brands. Um, and I'm sure mo most licensors you know, kind of feel the same. And, and to do that, you, you, you know, you'll operate at different price points. And so consistency needs, needs to be right from a, from a, a price value perspective and it, it needs to be you know consumer needs to get what they expect um but but we want to service every every single um you know member of the of the global community um and and so i think as a result we you know that that point around consistency there's just that kind of nuance for me around um you want consistency of quality but that might come at different price points what are the opportunities, Prahlad, and this is going to be my last point, then we'll open the questions for our audience uh, and Nisha will help us. But Prahlad, what are the opportunities that you're looking at or your group is looking at at this time uh, if, if, if you are in that frame of, frame of mind to sort of look at some? So uh, actually what's interesting is there are, uh, I think, a couple of behavioral trends which is uh, coming out. And I'm not saying it's linked only to licensing. It's linked to any brand which could potentially, uh, you know, ride on it and make it big in the country. So one emergence, which is I think big in China and not yet that evolved in the country is social commerce. I think social commerce is something in these times are picking up quite a bit. So there are communities who are well knit. So uh, across uh, across every city in, uh, uh, the, in, the, in the country, there are communities which say that, hey, we are like largely a safe zone. We are fine, right? And there is an influencer in there who's either arranging for you, from your local groceries all the way to your bakery items, to something in fashion, to something in essential, right? So I think social commerce is uh, something which could be a positive outcome out of this whole thing with respect to, you know, uh, trying to get leads through micro influencers as we call them. And I think uh, there are like Misho and whatnot, there are a few good successes in the country. I think as and when platforms like Flipkart, Mentra, Amazon, we all, the sooner these guys adapt uh, to this, I think it's a trend which is going to, and that also answers a little bit of your previous question with respect to it being the new normal with respect to, uh, let's say, uh, behavioral change, right? And more and more as people go into offline shops, the resistance to touch and feel and try products is going to reduce, right? Uh, the number of people in the shop is going to reduce. Uh, 
so what is the kind of at that point in time if you particularly like something how do you get it delivered to your house in the kind of let us say most hygienic manner people who are hygiene first quality first right those kind of additions to a brand's values is going to be critical going forward that's interesting um, michel alan uh, michel you can go first uh, what are the opportunities you you guys are evaluating at this time yeah i mean i think um, you know new opportunities and and new categories as you mentioned uh, in the beginning you know um, kind of the more obvious ones the face masks the covering the protective items um, you know we are seeing a lot of <clears throat> a lot of that coming out now and then also i think a resurgence to um, heritage <clears throat> so a lot of our brands that are um, evergreen and and kind of have a long legacy they're coming out with um, vintage styles or things that the consumers can connect to um, from the past that brings them a sense of um, safe, comfort, um, home, you know, so we, we see a lot of that also resurging and we're working with licensors to put together designs um, that focus on that kind of feeling, that, that warm feeling. So to be able to connect um, people to the brand a lot quicker. Alan, you want to add something? I'd, I'd love to, thank you. We, I spoke earlier about the research showing take 66 days to build a habit. It's been 66 days for almost everyone, almost everywhere. And, and the question for us is what habits have they built? Well, we, we've seen a few of them. Some of the items that have had even upticks in sales are things surrounding the home, such as some consumer electronics. The televisions have been doing great. Audio has been doing very, very well small kitchen appliances also very well. Um, I can't speak to India, but I know that if in the United States you wanted to go buy some flour or some yeast because you had plenty of time on your hands because you were at home, you wanted to bake some bread, good luck with that. They were out of stock. And I think that all of this time spent in people's houses has shown them all the wonderful things about their homes and their lives and also pointed out the shortfalls and the things that didn't work quite as well as they thought and, and weren't quite as comfortable or, or as, as useful as they thought. And so they're, they're looking at that toaster that they used to use some mornings because the other mornings they ate breakfast at the office or on their way to work or whatever. And they're saying, I really need to replace that. And so we're, we're seeing a lot of the things that surround the home and the lifestyle at home that are getting a pretty good bump here. And people, once again, they've developed these habits. We're getting the sense that a lot of people having discovered what telecommuting looks like are not rushing back to the office voluntarily anytime soon. They've really taken a lot of the good that's in the ability to work from home and they're going to try and keep some of it, which means that's going to linger. And those products that make them more comfortable and more productive at home, computer monitors have sold quite a bit keyboards, office furniture, office chairs, because before it was their home office and they maybe worked from home on Friday. And so they sat in that chair for a few hours on Friday and it was fine. It's not fine anymore when they're there five days a week or six or seven. And so we think there's going to be quite a continuation of business in, in those areas. And so we're looking to develop licensees who are taking appropriate brands that we represent into those spaces where we believe there's going to be a lot of growth in the future and satisfy a lot of consumer needs and, and really help to broaden a lot of brands. Uh, so so I, I'll ask uh, uh, Isha to sort of uh, help us with some questions here uh, and we'll take some of them and then I'll then follow up with you on those questions. So Isha, could we, could we have some, some push, follow -up yeah, questions? Yeah, sure, sir. I would uh, like the audio from Ms. Diksha Mehta. Uh, Diksha, you can unmute and ask your question, please. Hi, hi, everybody. Um, so this was just my question to Ben. Hi, Ben. Um, 
very uh, general question actually that you work so closely with uh, southeast asia and india over the years so you know just what's the main difference that you see in these markets uh, versus india you know especially in the current times and is that very different uh, from the west Lovely to meet you, Diksha. Um, I, I mean, the, the, there are some there are some significant and o- obvious differences between the, the, the two regions, and even within Southeast Asia, it's an incredibly diverse and, and fragmented region. So, so really, it's it's more kind of India within the kind of broader mix of Asia Asia Pac as a kind of as a region. But it, it, India is more developed from an e-com perspective. Um, uh, so I think in terms of DTC players, but also the um, you know the big guys like Amazon, Flipkart, etc. Um, and you know there's, there's obviously a, a really significant kind of taste, taste and, and preferences piece. But I, I think you know c- coming coming back to to, to my point on uh, you know the, the the sort of opportunity going going forward, we're we're really yet to see how this will kind of shake out. And I think you know to to, to Alan's point on um, some of those trends in terms of the um, the the home we're seeing, you know, home fitness and kids being educated at home. Um, again, we, we, you know, we don't know how enduring that's going to, going to be. So I think it, it'll be really interesting across all territories, injury included, to see um, the degree to which whether, as Alan says, six six days and and and, and habits have been formed. I'm, I'm personally hoping that my, my fitness regime uh, carries on, um, you know, or, or, or it kind of bounces back and, and, and we're in a slightly different environment. So it'll be, it'll be interesting to see. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Diksha. Great connecting with you. Uh, Diksha, if I connect well, uh, runs a very successful agency in India. It's called uh, Black White Orange and they're just doing some amazing work and they also handle uh, Hasbro in India. Isha, you could take the next question. Yeah. Thank you, Diksha. Thank you, sir. The, can you unmute Ajit Goswami? Ajit Goswami, can you be online, please? And ask your question. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Yeah, I'm Oswald. Yeah. yeah uh, my question to the panel is that, uh, like, uh, in this COVID pandemic, I think the uh, distribution boundaries are being breached. Uh, now we have new set of challenges and new sort of opportunities in terms of distribution boundaries. So, uh, is is there any possibilities that brands uh, would go, like to go themselves online or by way of uh, digitally distributing their own products and rather going through the licensee routes? So, sure, this question I'll uh, direct to Alan, uh, um, Michelle, and. Uh... Pralat, how are you seeing uh, this channel conflict, potential channel, channel conflict uh, coming in? And in fact, Ben can also take up that. So, Alan, we'll go with you first. Well, so far, we haven't seen much blurring of channels um, as a result of this, depending on how popular you are and, and which market you're in and how effective the government is at shutting down uh, parallel imports, if you will, or infringements, depending on how they're denominated. Uh, We really haven't seen a lot of change here. What we have seen, interestingly enough, is that 31% of consumers have actually discovered a new brand because the brand they wanted wasn't available. So it's been an interesting time in that way. Um, And then you can take whatever you want from that statistic in terms of what the opportunities are. But, But in terms of whether these times have bred more people breaching the obligations and license agreements, we haven't seen it as yet. I certainly turn it over to the rest of the panel to see what their experience has been, but we haven't seen that anywhere in the world. Yeah, I could, I could um, add to what Alan was saying. I think I agree. You know, we really haven't had any um, disruptions or uh, any conflicts as of yet, but we are, um, I think, specifically defining uh, categories and uh, terms within the contracts a bit more. So I think Ben had mentioned something earlier where um, reaching all the different price points. Um, so that's something that um, we've noticed um, adding into the contracts, um, making sure that price price points are clearly defined in the contracts. Um, so the licensees do not go outside their boundaries uh, within each, uh, but also making sure that 
each segment is captured, if it's to the mass or the upper end um, or the lower end, whatever that may be. Um, and then, you know, in terms of even artwork, we've noticed um, some licensees um, tend to use only certain styles of artwork from a brand, um, whether it be, um, you know, logo centered or um, maybe it's just more of a spring line um, that they don't get into the fall winter. Um, so we've seen a lot of um, segmenting, you know, kind of carving out in the contracts in terms of those specifics. Um, and as long as that's there, the licensees have been kind of following that, but we haven't really had uh, people cross over and try to go beyond. Um, if they did, they would, you know, request if they can. And, you know, obviously we would say that there's someone already covering that, or maybe there isn't, and we'd be able to put them into that market or that segment. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it also ties it back into making sure everybody's in constant communication and the program's very transparent so everybody can understand the playing field and kind of uh, works together instead of stepping on each other's toes. Any of the panelists wants to add further, otherwise we can jump on to the next question that the panelists have explained as well. Sure. Isha, you could take the next question. Yeah, if you... yeah. can we have Mr. Naresh Rahuja? Naresh, uh, you could uh, unmute you yourself and you can ask question, question it to the panel. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello, can you hear you? Yeah, hello everybody. Good evening. Thank you for your uh, lovely session. Uh, I want to ask you like uh, for a, what, what should a person look for in a brand uh, when they choose, like for example, we manufacture disinfectants with a very different type of uh, use where we offer medical grade sanitization to normal uh, household uh, purposes in offices and you know gyms for schools for all these purposes so these are all uh, nano silver technology disinfectants so if we want to uh, go with a famous brand or with a brand which is synonymous with this type of category what should we look forward and how it should should we choose and what should be the terms and conditions we should look for uh, which will benefit both of us Thank you. I'll direct this question to again Gen Z folks. So, um, Michelle, do you want to guide? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, what would be best for you is to, you know, try to find brands that you mentioned that are synonymous with this type of category, but also have ties into certain areas. So you said, you know, if you're looking for something that ties into school, you know, there's certain brands that have educational ties or that have initiatives that, um, you know, put out more educational based programs or curriculum, you know, ways in which that you could tie into something that the brand owner is already uh, promoting themselves, you know, that'll help make the product more authentic. Um, and same with medical grade, you know, brands that have hospital ties or, um, you know, initiatives with um, those type of workers and nursing and doctors, um, you know, I would say things where you can connect to initiatives that the brand owners are putting out there now and have, um, you know, social compliance efforts and strategies in the future, um, which most of the, the brands should communicate, um, you know, either if you look on their websites or in their communications, or if you come to, let's say, an agency and, and talk to someone here, we'd be able to kind of give you um, the strategies for the next two plus years that companies are looking to set up um, and, you know, where you could fit into that and also where the current licensees are and what they're currently selling and how you can become a, a better part of that. You know, again, I think it's, it's about working as a team with everyone right now and that only will help build your own specific program if you come into a group, a strong group that has um, established product and established distribution out that can, you know, that you can utilize. 
how are we doing on time? Thank you, Michelle. Uh, how are we doing on, on time, Isha? So we can, can we take a few more questions? Uh, so I think the rest of the questions can be answered offline. We are ready for the next session. Great. So that's a clear direction now. So uh, thank you, panelists. It's been a great panel. Uh, I know uh, our audience been uh, hooked to the Zoom, Zoom webinar for last almost three hours, but you, you've been very engaging and you've, you've done a, uh, quite a bit of a help in terms of uh, solving some questions. I know uh, it's very early for you, uh, uh, Alan and Michelle, so have a, have a great day and, uh, you Thank know. Thank you so uh, much. Enjoy your drinks, Ben. Thank we, you. I think it's end of the day for you. So have a, have a uh, stay safe and thank you much for being a great fan. Thank you. It was yeah. a wonderful thank session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It was good fun. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Let's move on to our uh, last session for the day. That is on Legal 101, Safeguard Measures for Licensees Due to COVID-19. Let me introduce our speaker for this session. It's uh, Ms. Jonathan, Mr. Jonathan Becker, President Anjar Company Co. LLC. Thank you, Jonathan, for your valuable time. Over to you. Hi, Jonathan. Okay. Okay. Good morning. Can anybody, can everybody hear me and see me, hopefully? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting me here to speak. Today, um, we're going to talk, well, I'm going to talk today about legal remedies that may be available to licensees and licensors um, in view of the COVID-19 situation, and more specifically about the options that both the licensee and even the licensor have um, with regard to the contract, the license agreement. Um, so let me just start by giving you a little bit of my background. I appreciate, I see that uh, you've put up uh, my background information here, but I want to also talk about my background with respect to the perspective that I have uh, on things here today. So just so you understand, I am an attorney. My background is in IP law. I specialize in patents, trademarks, copyrights, and um, licensing law in particular. I have been focused on licensing in the toy industry uh, for the past 35 plus years. In fact, I grew up in the toy industry and I'll give you a little bit of that background as well. Um, so I am an attorney, but I'm also a businessman and an academic. Um, as a businessman, uh, first, um, I try to look for the practical. Uh, I try to look for how solutions can uh, resolve issues um, rather than uh, create or um, confront problems uh, in an adversarial way. So as a businessman, I represent, on the most part, licensors. But as a lawyer with an international patent and trademark firm for many years, I represented both licensors and licensees in a wide and diverse uh, field, as diverse as ventricular assist devices, cochlear implants, and of course, toys. As an educator, I am an adjunct professor at the Fashion Institute of Technology, where 32 years ago, they created the first four-year college degree program in toy design. I co-wrote that curriculum and have taught business practices there since the beginning of the program, focusing on legal protection for the toy industry and in particular patents, trademarks, and copyrights, trade secrets, and licensing. Uh, so finally, I'm the president of Andra Company, a company that my dad founded 52 years ago. Jim Becker was a famous toy inventor. He's recognized as a pioneer in licensing uh, as the 74th inductee into the Toy Industry Hall of Fame in 2018. We develop our own IP at Andra, but we also represent IP owners for licensing their products and brands. So I work with licensors um, and licensees in licensing um, and in representing uh, their products as well. Um, my, 
I work with Patty, my wife, who has uh, her own company called Becker Associates. Patty has a 40 year background in the toy industry, specializing um, in early childhood development and education. She uh, represents inventors and entrepreneurs, helping them develop and uh, license their ideas. So with that understanding of my background, and I want to be sure you understand that my perspective is primarily of a business one. Understanding the legal issues allows me, I think, uh, to better understand the business uh, situation and to deal on a business level with uh, my customers rather than, as I said, on a legal level. Um, so let's address the issues that have arisen in view of the COVID-19 situation and what steps we should take, licensees and licensors should take at this, at this stage. First, I strongly urge everyone to review their contract very carefully, reviewing both the business terms and the financial terms, including the specific payment provisions as to the due dates and the amounts due. Um, look at what constitutes a technical breach or a cause for termination in that license agreement. And look at the procedure for terminating that contract. All of these will give you an, a fuller understanding of um, not only the situation you're in, but the possible solutions, including the provisions that may address how to cure a default um, and the remedies that the contract will provide. Um, and importantly, the period in which the licensee has um, and is allowed to cure their default or their breach. So only the specific agreement can address those issues. Um, there are also other very important provisions that a licensee needs to be aware of. Some of those um, provisions will impact um, whether the contract uh, can continue, including the potential for what's known as a cross terminating provision. Some license agreements um, will be terminated if other license agreements by that licensee, or, or excuse me, are in default. In other words, a breach of one agreement will cause termination in all contracts. So you need to know uh, whether there is such cross terminating provisions in your license agreements. The question that's coming up most often now and is most relevant uh, to licensees today is what's known as the force majeure provision. Uh, force majeure um, essentially uh, allows for the suspension this is temporary suspension of the obligations of the parties as long as that situation, as long as that um, event uh, is, uh, is uh, existing. These events generally include things like acts of God, uh, fire, flood, earthquake. It may also, it may also enumerate a pandemic as a condition um, which would allow for the temporary suspension of the obligations of the agreement. Regardless of whether or not your agreement allows for um, suspension of uh, the agreement and the licensee's payment obligations and other obligations uh, during this time, there are other options that a licensee has. Very important options exist even where you do not have a force majeure clause. So there's always the situation that one can point to of impossibility. So impossibility um, or frustration of purpose will often come up as a basis uh, for claiming that non-compliance of the agreement or default should be excused. So even without a force majeure clause um, and without a force majeure clause specifically stating um, the cause uh, um, that, that we are suffering from a pandemic, um, 
it is possible that the licensee can find other relief. So a force majeure clause only allows you to suspend temporarily your obligations because of the impossibility of the situation, um, you are forgiven for as long as that lasts. Now that's not permanent. And most force majeure clauses have a limited period of time, usually three months, but there may also be an opportunity in that same force majeure clause for the licensor to terminate. So you need to study the agreement and specifically if there's a force majeure clause, whether the right to suspend or even the right of the licensor to terminate exists. So force majeure um, may work to excuse all or part of your obligations while this uh, pandemic is going on. And even if there isn't a force majeure clause, there are other, um, there are other recourses that, that you may be able to take. Keep in mind that this is a partnership between the licensor and the licensee. The licensor is motivated to, um, to find a solution to resolve the situation. The licensor understands, as we all do, the present situation, but also understands that most licensees are in the situation that you're in. However, there are licensors who want to look, and from what we see a majority of licensors want to take the situation on a case by case basis. So while they will look to work out in many cases, um, a solution with the licensee, um, they also need to look at the specific circumstances. In our industry, for example, in the toy industry, there are some sectors that are actually overperforming. Sectors like puzzles and outdoor uh, equipment, their sales are surging in those categories. So the licensor might say that it's not um, necessary or reasonable to suspend the licensee's obligations where they're doing a good business. But certainly uh, many licensees are suffering and they need solutions and licensors know this. So let's talk about briefly a couple of the common solutions that we are, um, we are seeing and that we are implementing ourselves. And probably the first um, one that I am, uh, recommend and that is being used certainly by many licensors is the concept of extending the guarantee period. As you know, licensees have a minimum royalty guarantee for a period, sometimes by quarter, sometimes by year. Um, and licensors are in many cases willing to extend what would ordinarily be a quarter or a year um, for a longer period of time. For example, a year can turn into a year and a half. So beginning the third quarter this year for agreements we're signing, licensees can have the year through 2021. So this eases the burden on the licensee. We also are, uh, are, are in negotiations on a case-by-case -case basis with our licensees to defer payments uh, to reduce payments, and in some cases to reduce or eliminate minimum guarantees so that the only obligation of the licensee is to pay on actual sales. So that's a true partnership there as well. Uh, when the licensee um, isn't burdened um, by guarantees or commitments um, that they are uh, unable to make uh, uh, or achieve in these circumstances. So again, working this out is something in the licensors and the licensee's interest. Um, in our business uh, of paramount importance uh, are good business relations. And so um, there is a lot of uncertainty um, from a licensor's point of view of squeezing a licensee too hard. Um, first of all, if they squeeze so hard, they licensee may go away and they'll, they'll get nothing. Um, and of course, they want an ongoing relationship with this licensee in many cases. So they're often looking for amicable solutions to resolve these issues um, and, um, and to uh, reduce um, the pressure on the licensee. For example, as I said, extending the minimum guarantee periods. Other um, solutions we've seen is cross-collateralizing 
contracts where contract for one product can be applied to another. Um, the minimum guarantees spread over multiple contracts. Um, so there are solutions um, and they start with a plan. I suggest everyone have a plan to discuss with their licensor um, and propose uh, whether it's a deferred payment schedule, a, um, a removal of certain guarantees or an extension of those guarantees. Again, most licensors are looking at the situation on a case by case basis um, and are willing in most cases to, um, to, to resolve these things uh, in a friendly way. Uh, voiding legal disputes is something that I, um, I look to do at, 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 at most, uh, at any opportunity. Um, resolving things in a business-like manner is the goal um, of any businessman. Um, taking things into a courtroom um, presents all kinds of problems, not the least of which is the uncertainty um, of any resolution in a courtroom situation, um, in addition to the uh, high costs of such uh, legal action. So um, in short, I, uh, I will say that licensors have an interest in resolving um, difficult situations for licensees. Licensees um, need to approach um, licensors um, with a plan or should uh, take um, affirmative steps and find solutions that help resolve these uh, problems uh, on a friendly, on an amicable basis. So I think that, um, that, 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 that it concludes my discussion um, on um, what, is, what licensees are facing today and the approach that they should be taking to find solutions. I will also add um, that licensees understand the value of a license, the value added uh, to a license, um, and needs they, the licensor understands that this is a symbiotic relationship and is um, motivated to, to, uh, to maintain its relationships with licensees so that the uh, licensing business for them um, continues as well. Um, and that concludes my, my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, for sharing your insights. Uh, could you, uh, let's move on to the Q&A sessions now. Uh, can we connect Naresh Ahuja online, please? Naresh, could you unmute and ask your question? Hello, Naresh, can you unmute and answer your, ask your question, please? I'll ask the question, Jonathan. Uh, he says that say a license develops the brand in the area and if the licensor themselves decide to enter into that category and do not want to renew the contact, contract, what are the steps then? Okay, I'm, I'm, could, could you please, please repeat? So the licensor does not want to renew the contract. Um, I, that's all I that's all I was able to hear. Could you repeat the full okay. question? Uh, say a license develops the brand in the area and if the licensor themselves decide to enter into that category and do not renew the contract for the same. Yes. Okay, so what are the implications of that? Are you, is that the question of, of, of such a situation? Well, um, you know, a licensor um, often is in the business um, um, uh, at least um, in a related business to the licensee um, or may think that they can profit from it. It's important that your agreements specify in all cases that neither the licensor or the licensee can compete directly um, with the other party during the term of the agreement. In fact, as a licensor, um, I expe uh, um, expect that the licensee won't compete directly with my item even after. Um, but the, the fact is that licensors see the profit that the licensee is making um, and may want to, um, to, to take on the product. I want to add something else with regard to a solution that this question raises also. I've seen licensors now purchase us licensees' products 
and sell them themselves through their channels of distribution. Um, and so that, that helps licensees out as well um, by adding an additional channel of distribution. So um, they're not competitors there. In that case, they're actually partnering with them. Um, but to the, to, the, to the questioner, I would say it's important that your license agreement um, have the provisions that prohibit this kind of direct competition um, either directly uh, during the agreement or directly after. And in particular, where the goods are confusingly similar. Um, because what they're doing, of course, is they're, they're taking advantage of the publicity and success that the licensee had with the product, with the brand, um, and converting it to their own. But again, you have to look to the terms of the agreement to see if it's allowed or not. Okay. Great. Uh, Isha, you have another question? Okay. Yes, sir. So, uh, could we have uh, Supratim? Could you unmute and ask your question? Post COVID, this situation currently, what is the situation we are going through? Post COVID, what would be the initiative all over the world for the business development? Will it be the same before COVID, or will there is something new change we will going to see? Okay, so um, if if I understand your question, you're asking what will change as a result of the COVID situation. That's really all I was able to 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 get to to hear. Can you can you elaborate what specifically what you meant? What what kind of changes were you referring to? Uh, approach to the customers. That is my main focus. Uh... Because currently we are approaching the customer in the online, you know, digital platforms and other things. So physical connection with the customer, will it change and the online system will remain the same or maybe there is something combo system will implement it? Well, you know, I think it's fair to say that, that we, no one has, uh, no one knows what the future will hold. This is uncharted territory for everyone. What I do think though, from how I've seen this, the, the, the licensing industry evolve over the last 40 years is it's very adaptable. So um, I, have, I have no doubt that we will adapt um, as we have uh, largely done um, in, over the past uh, weeks um, to on greater online presence and, and greater communications. But I think we all understand that the interpersonal contact is a strong element in selling. And selling is something we all have to do regardless of what business we're in. So that personal contact, I have to hope, um, will come back to some extent. But do I think it has changed forever that um, the way we've done business in the past? Absolutely. We're already, of course, doing a lot more online business. And the businesses that are succeeding um, in this situation best are the businesses that have adapted um, and have a greater percentage of their sales online. So um, that's clearly where we were heading before. And I think the situation has only accelerated uh, that, uh, that development. Okay. That's all for now. Uh, there's one question from uh, Roger Berman. Could we have Roger Berman? Could, could he unmute and ask the question? I'll ask the question on his behalf. If a licensing agent Hello. is involved, Hello, okay, can, he's there. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, Jonathan. I know I know Laura quite well. I hope you both fit. I hope you both fit get, uh, safe in these circumstances. Thank um, you. If, I'm calling, taking part from Tokyo. Thank you to Franchise India for organising this. So, if a licensing agent is is involved in the arrangement with the licensor and licensee. Uh, the agent may get squeezed on its cash flow if the licensor is giving minimum guarantee relief to the licensee. Are there any solutions for an agent in such a situation? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great question, considering that we, we, we are an agent in, um, and, and that's a large part of our business. Um, so you know, once again, I would have to say this, this, the solutions require um, a collective effort and collective sacrifices in that regard. And so clearly the agent's success is tied to 
um, the licensor and the licensee. And so they're an integral part of any solution. So unfortunately, yes, the, lace, the, the agent will, will be affected uh, in, in the, his capa or her capacity as an agent. Um, and yet, you know, we have to, we have to value our relationships uh, enough to understand that going forward, um, there will be a light at the end of this tunnel, even if, even if it isn't there now. Uh, so my primary concern at this point, uh, other than, of course, having the necessary cash flow uh, for our licensees to survive, is to li is live another day um, and make the accommodations um, that we all need to make. So frankly, it's a collective effort. Um, and I see that the uh, agents are making the same sacrifices. We are deferring payments. Uh, we are um, we are eliminating uh, some uh, guarantees. We are cross collateralizing them so that uh, one contract can be applied to uh, to others. So we're trying to 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 sacrifice along with our 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 licensors and licensees. And I really think that's what everyone has to see this as. Um, you know. Lack, for lack of a better phrase, we are all in it together and we all need to have a collective uh, solution. I hope that, I hope thank that's you. responsive. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Roger. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, uh, you said that we, that we conclude? Uh, yes, we can conclude, sir. So Jonathan, thank you very much. That was, that was very helpful. I, I know for sure that, you know, we are all uh, in it together, uh, but uh, business requires a certain amount of uh, legal complexities, and you know, uh, uh, experts like you are advising us how to how to sort of minimize our risks there. So thank you uh, very much for you know, for joining us. Uh, thank you, pan, uh, delegates. I, I know it's been a long uh, session, and uh, uh, but we we are very happy to have concluded this uh, uh, this first virtual event. Uh, um, license India organizes the only licensing trade show in the country and, uh, and the team at License India has uh, thought that it was a great opportunity for us to bring um, experts as well as uh, uh, attendees from all over the world in this virtual uh, half, day, half day program and I'm very thankful that all of you have taken time out and joined here. Uh, we will be back with another addition to this uh, uh, and uh, Till that time, uh, I, I would I would like to sort of uh, leave you with the thought that you know this is this is the time when new opportunities would come. These are the times which are challenging times, and you all need to know uh, do your bit in terms of managing your relationships. So relationships will go stronger. Um, opportunities will emerge out of them, and um, you know this this is this is a time of a lot of innovation which is happening. A lot of creativity is happening. Uh, within within the confines of the limitations that we have, so uh, so I I wish you uh, good health, safety, and hope to see you back uh, in both physical as well as virtual events uh, very soon. So thank you very much, and thank you my co-hosts here uh, for joining, and thank you Jonathan for for a very insightful presentation there. Thank you Jonathan for your thank time. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Thank and you. I would like to thank everybody else for this insightful discussion, our esteemed panelists. Thank you for all the attendees for have, having this wonderful session. We, uh, we wish to see you again in near future and hopefully offline and not in the confines of our houses. Please fill in a short survey for us to get the relevant feedback on this webinar. Also, you can follow our social media account on License India. Stay healthy, stay safe, everyone. Let's fight this virus together. Thank you. Thank you, Isha. You've been great. Thank you. Thank you.